we go. <laughs> Great. Uh, Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Present. Morales? Diep? Present. Crosco? Davis? Esparza? Arenas? Foley? Here. Camus? Here. Jones? Licardo? Here. That's five. Okay, well, let's, uh, I know we don't technically need a quorum, but it'd probably be a good idea for us to wait a minute or two. So why don't we do that? <clears throat> Jones just signed on. So there's your six. Okay, great. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, and uh, a big thank you to the hardworking team uh, that has been leading our Beautify SJ efforts, and many of them have been doing a lot of other things too. So uh, thanks to everyone for your hard work. We know this is a really difficult challenge. Uh, Dave, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and um, very much appreciate the time with you all today um, uh, to talk about this really important issue. Um, and that's really uh, you know, a challenge that obviously our city has faced for a long time, but it's certainly intensified here over the past many months. And that's the issue of trash and debris and blight and the conditions in our city. And, and certainly this issue is an intersecting issue with other crises. And I think today we'll focus mostly on, on the trash crisis, um, but uh, the team will provide, you know, the relevant context with the other intersecting issues. Um, and before I turn it over to Jim, um, you know, I, I think it's just important to note, and I think we know, all know this, um, there's no easy fixes and no shortcuts for addressing uh, the, the trash and blight in, in, our, in our city. Um, and I think the only way it really gets fixed is if we continue the hard and disciplined and systematic uh, approach that we are now taking through uh, the EOC process. And I think that EOC process has really allowed us to take a, a new approach to addressing this super hard uh, challenge. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really gonna, you know, boil down to, um, you know, an organizational commitment to, to doing this work and certainly a commitment from all of us in terms of resourcing the work. Um, and prioritizing the work and being accountable to the work. Um, and it's certainly not you know, up to one department, it's really all of us being committed to this as we move forward. Um, and I, I do think we have an opportunity to, to really kind of uh, build on the work that we've done here recently in 2020 as we look into 2021. Um, I, I do think we have an opportunity and so today, um, hopefully, we're, we're presenting somewhat of a path forward. And, and you'll see kind of, uh, to use Jim's words, uh, kind of a method to the madness um, to this approach. But I, I do think what we're presenting today is an opportunity um, to, to move forward. Um, and as, as the mayor noted, there's been some tremendous work done under very difficult circumstances you know, by our teams out in the field, um, our, our virtual teams. Um, you know, I just want to thank the entire team for all their work on this. Um, it's extremely tough work. Uh, the work can feel demoralizing um, because it feels like we're never making the progress that we want to make. And it feels like we're never meeting expectations. And, and that can be a really tough environment to work in. Um, but the team's not giving up. I can guarantee you that. Um, and I also want to personally thank uh, Jim Orfall for, for leading this effort. Uh, Jim has brought, I think, a new perspective to this crisis. Um, many of you know that uh, Jim and I are plus 30 years with the city and we go way back. Um, and I think he's brought uh, the needed intensity to this work in leadership and management and organizational skills. Uh, to really uh, work with the team and, and lay out a, a plan uh, for us to move forward. So once again, thanks to the entire team. Thanks, Jim. And if you can uh, lead us through the presentation today. Yeah, thank you, Dave, uh, very much. 
So good morning, Mayor, members of the Council, uh, Jim Ortbald, Deputy City Manager and EOC Operations Coordinator. Uh, joining me this morning uh, for our presentation on Beautify SJ Response are Neil Rofino, the Assistant Director of PRNS and the EOC Co-Branch Director, Rick Scott, Deputy Director of Transportation and the Co-Branch Director as well, Sarah Zarate, Assistant to the City Manager and Bl Branch Planning Director, and Olympia Williams, Beautify SJ Program Manager and the Branch Operations Director. You can tell all these people have kind of two jobs uh, as we're, we've been working throughout the year. But we're here this morning to take a fairly deep dive into the city's emergency response to a series of intersecting crises. You can see them on the, on the slide there. Trash and blight, homelessness, and the pandemic. Trash and blight and homelessness existed before the pandemic, have been exacerbated by the pandemic, and they'll exist after the pandemic, unfortunately. And the question on trash though, is to what extent? And on trash and debris, we have specific strategies and service models that can effectively address this crisis if we continue our current efforts to be systematic, disciplined, and invest adequately now and in the future on the right systems, services, and people. Equally or more important, we have a community plan to end homelessness that the council has endorsed and that must be implemented with the same focus and adequate investment, but also in a very compassionate way. If we were to house and shelter our most vulnerable with dignity and slow the resulting flow of uncontrolled trash being generated in encampments in our city. Next slide, please. So in terms of our agenda for this morning, we have a robust 70 slide PowerPoint that we expect to deliver in about an hour and 15 minutes. So we, we beg your indulgence and patience here, but we're gonna leave the remaining hour and 45 minutes for city council questions and comment and guidance on our strategies and then public comment as well. So we'll start in section one with some brief context setting about five slides on the Beautify SJ initiative its origins and what it has evolved into and what has changed since its inception in 2017. We will focus on the very real challenges of 2020, specifically having to build a new service model in a virtual team environment and then mobilize field teams to restart and enhance existing and new services to address trash and blight in our city coming from multiple sources. Then moving on to section two, about six slides, we'll provide more background on Beautify SJ, highlighting key services and activities, and mentioning the related organizational work that began in 2019, aimed at better coordinating services across departments. That pre-work laid the foundation for developing a more integrated Beautify SJ program for which the need for better integration has become so apparent since the pandemic has hit. So moving on to section three, it's about 46 slides. That will be the bulk of the information that we'll present this morning. And it aims to ground the council in our experience over the last many months as we launched EOC Beautify SJ Service Model 1.0. We will provide brief context around the community plan to end homelessness and the related public health considerations around encampments during the pandemic. We will also provide a detailed timeline of issues and actions related to Beautify SJ during the pandemic, including a quick review of where we were in mid-June when we stood up the COC branch in the midst of trying to make sense of numerous disparate sets of manual data. Most importantly, we will lay out the branch's guiding principles and provide a live demo of the newly development newly developed GIS database that is capturing location, production, frequency, and conditions, and then get into the robust field work that has been completed and continues to be performed every single day of the week, including the different encampment service tiers, the new geographic zone based service model, and new encampment protocols and tools being used by the EOC to address difficult conditions 
in encampments and in the surrounding neighborhoods. We will also outline other beautify SJ services and the ramped up coordination efforts with numerous other agencies that own land in San Jose, like Caltrans and the Union Pacific Railroad. And then we'll conclude section three with the lessons learned and program insights, which we have many. Section four, about nine slides, we'll wrap it up. We'll recap our plan that's underway to fully reassess the previously existing Beautify SJ program elements and lay out our updated vision and mission for the program going forward. We'll also describe our interim strategy through June of 2021, the end of the fiscal year, and a concept Beautify SJ organization chart for service model 2.0 that we want to roll out in July of 2021. We will lay out numerous roadmap priorities for 2021 and have a specific focus on our effort to move from output measurements to outcome performance measurements, getting to a clean city. So next slide, please. So moving into, this is section one on the agenda. Beautify SJ is a community initiative. It was launched by our mayor in 2017 and leverages community engagement and is focused on reclaiming our public spaces. Next slide, please. So the Beautify SJ program has grown over the years and it's become a lot of things to a lot of people, both in our community and in our city organization, from murals and anti-graffiti to enhanced median islands to trail, creek and encampment cleanups. Taking inventory, assessing what works and what's less effective and what should be consolidated into PRNS or elsewhere in the city organization is a necessary part of this overall effort. It is underway and will be an important part of the 2021 Beautify SJ Roadmap. So important realities are significantly affecting the workload of the Beautify SJ program, and we need to acknowledge them, including a 58% increase in unsheltered residents from 2017 to 2019, a 52% increase in illegal dumping reports during the same period, and a 26% increase in the amount of graffiti removed. Addressing blight and beautifying San Jose is a tougher job today than when the initiative began in 2017. The COVID pandemic brought a whole new level of challenge and complexity to the work, its safety, how it could be done, including the initial early suspensions and the early confusing days of the pandemic. Many services were suspended until they could be figured out how to be done safely, but most everything has been restored at this point in time. COVID-19 was not the only challenge in 2020. We've had unprecedented protest, social unrest, damage to public property, and wildfire response and poor air quality. They also made Beautify SJ work more challenging and created higher workload demands for our team. Focus was also heightened on other agencies and the condition of their properties. And the branch launched an initiative to better collaborate and improve conditions on non-city public properties, which we'll share more with you later. So then moving on to section two of the agenda, we aim to build a deeper understanding of the specific services and activities of the Beautify SJ program. And I'll turn it over to Neil Rufino, the EOC co-branch director to present this section. Thanks, Jim. You know, as mentioned earlier, Beautify San Jose is a community, community blight reduction initiative whose goals were to create partnership and leverage services between the city, the community, nonprofits, and other government agencies, with many of these services initially falling to the Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services Department to initiate. At the core elements of Beautify San Jose was built upon, uh, was the ongoing success and efforts of our anti-graffiti, anti-litter programs. In the last fiscal year, the anti-graffiti program removed more than 2.5 square feet of graffiti, a 9% increase, and in partnership with the Office of Cultural Affairs, installed nine new murals on some of the most tagged structures across the city. Anti-litter, whose base is the coordination of resident volunteers, coordinated over 61 successful dump neighborhood dumpster days and coordinated over 375 litter pickup events. Beautify also saw the emergence of new pilot initiatives 
such as SJ Bridge, which employs homeless and formerly homeless individuals at 70 sites across the city. One of the other key programs to help the city stay clean is the RAPID program managed out of the Environmental Services Department. RAPID's focus on illegal dumping over the years shows growth in both tons collected and the amount of self-discoveries or proactive pickups conducted by staff. That progress was stymied in the beginning of 2019-20 as the pandemic shut down many city services. But with the reactivation of the RAPID team within the Beautify branch, service levels are continuing to increase. Over the past few years, what we have seen has been a greater need for citywide coordination of services. The slide here shows the numerous programs and services that interrelate with Beautify SJ. However, these services are scattered across multiple departments, have different measurement metrics and program objectives that are not always aligned. As such, this calls for an effort for us as a city to improve our coordination and organizational alignment we need to move our efforts toward a one vision, a continuum of services from prevention, education, and community engagement to response and maintenance, where this branch has really focused on in the last few months around encashment trash management, and finally through an ideally coordinated enforcement effort. The trash and blight that we are seeing are symptoms of root causes and systematic problems that the entire city has to continue to gather around to help solve. As such, Prior to COVID, city teams across all these apart departments began to map out what the city needs in order to help manage these challenges. We took part in a very intensive multi-day effort that helped us understand some root causes and internal challenges and begin the revisioning of Beautify San Jose. This pandemic initially halted the effort, but with the issues and needs visually growing before us, it provided us the opportunity to pivot and establish this Beautify branch as part of the EOC and move us to take care of the issues today and plan for a 2021 roadmap that systemizes these work streams. I'd like to turn this back over to Jim to further discuss uh, into the service model 1.0. So thank you, Neil. So section three of the agenda is our longest section. It's about 46 slides and it's the heart of the response effort thus far, Service Model 1.0. So initially the information will focus on the encampment trash program, a newly developed and deployed service. And then we'll transition to the other aspects of Beautify SJ response. We're gonna provide a live data system demonstration, and then we'll delve into the details of the interagency work and we'll conclude with the lessons learned and program insights and set us up for section four. Before we get into the details of the Beautify SJ response, it's important to set some context around homelessness. In August, the city council endorsed the countywide community plan to end homelessness, a robust and compassionate response to a challenge that has plagued our most vulnerable residents and the community for many years. The work of three EOC branches, Beautify SJ Response, Homeless Support and Services, and Emergency Housing were developed to address the conditions during the pandemic. But as a clear parallel benefit, the response also aligned to address numerous three priorities in strategy three of the plan. And we did it much more quickly than we normally would have done. Beyond the most important and obvious benefit of sheltering homeless residents that will come from the successful implementation of the community plan is the, the parallel benefit of reduced trash and debris that blights our neighborhoods and needs to be picked up by the city. Next slide. But once the pandemic hit our nation and local community in March, the CDC and County Public Health advise that all efforts should be made to shelter people living outside, which we've made tremendous efforts to do. But if sheltering was not possible for everybody, agencies should suspend encampment abatements and stop forcing dispersal of unsheltered people, which would aid in reducing community spread of COVID. The city accordingly suspended wide scale use of abatements and that action is a piece of a broader public health strategy 
who has seen the avoidance of serious COVID outbreaks in an unsheltered encampments. So as part of that public health strategy, the city has offered other hygiene services in encampments and around encampments and the new, the new encampment trash program. And I'll turn it over to Rick to dive into the branch goals and the process of building and deploying service model 1.0. Thank you, Jim. In mid-June, the Beautify SJ response branch was activated within the EOC to dramatically expand trash and cleanup services and support the public health strategy for our residents that Jim just mentioned. Our team came together quickly and established three strategic goals. As you can see here, the first two immediate goals were to increase emergency trash pickup and develop systematic waste disposal for San Jose encampment residents. We will be calling this service model 1.0. And our second goal, to ensure the continuity of existing Beautify SJ initiatives and programs mentioned earlier in the presentation. In light of longstanding and growing citywide challenges, we established strategic goal three, which we will refer to later as service model 2.0. Our aim with this last goal is to really understand the whole need and scope of citywide trash and blight problems, define the needs that will provide the desired outcomes, and maximally leverage existing and new people and resources to deliver the desired results. This slide provides a high level timeline of operations beginning in mid-March when the shelter in place order went into effect. The table at the top breaks down our branch life cycle into four phases, which align with the monthly timeline uh, down there below. On the timeline below, the yellow text and dates mark important milestones in the development, design, and delivery of service model 1.0. The blue text below the timeline aligns with key milestones in the other Beautify SJ or related and aligned programs. With respect to service model 1.0, when the SIP went into effect, the Beautify SJ staff quickly adapted to perform trash bag drop off and pick up at approximately 60 sites throughout the city. As the pandemic progressed and conditions continued to worsen, the EOC activated our branch in mid June to broaden and expand the resources and staff devoted to this challenge. As the branch coalesced and began working together, we quickly assessed homeless encampments citywide and developed a tiered service model, which I will touch on later. We launched services in our lower tiers and began piloting dumpster deployments in July while initiating a procurement for tra more intensive trash service at 120 plus of our largest and most complex encampments. We awarded the contracts and fully initiated our service model in late October. I want to point out that you will recognize many of the slides and concepts that follow, but it is really important for us to briefly revisit these to understand the breadth and depth of effort and how that informs our way ahead. As we marshaled our team and unified our efforts, it became immediately clear that any response to these longstanding challenges, which had been exacerbated by COVID, were hampered by systems that were complaint driven, insufficiently staffed and resources, and with disparate data sets and data systems that were not integrated. As we moved ahead, we knew we'd have to examine, adapt, and act on these challenges to build a better system for all San Jose residents. This slide highlights one of our first and most fundamental planning challenges. Where should encampment trash services be delivered? The answer to this question was complicated by the fact that illegal dumping and encampment trash issues needed to be scoped, are intersectional but distinct, are widespread, and are so vast that service gaps inevitably led to poor conditions throughout the entire city. This slide highlights the operational challenges faced by our field crews, whereas regular residential and commercial trash pickup is systematic, planned and has high levels of resident compliance, the photo here on the left shows how much more complicated providing regular trash services to a homeless encampment can be, requiring substantial staff time and handwork, as well as resident interactions and cooperation to ensure good conditions. Further challenge is aligning expectations with results. With abatements performed only in certain limited instances, the objective of our service is to help facilitate cleaner and more sanitary conditions for our unsheltered and sheltered residents alike and minimize the displacement and movement of people during COVID. <laughs> this slide represents the scoping challenge faced by our team. You can see six distinct intake processes and databases with varying degrees of performance measures and metrics. As we discussed in September, if you'll recall, our team analyzed and combined these, all of these disparate data sets to create hotspot maps showing where the issues intersected. With the support of our public works partners and DOT, GIS and data analysts were able to craft 83 routes to be field assessed by redeployed city staff to determine with both photos and notes, the actual conditions in the field. 
Over a period of four weeks, these employees were able to assess and document conditions along all of these routes and approximately 20 hundred miles of city, 200 miles of city streets. So as we dig into Service Model 1.0, we, we now know this problem scoping and data analysis process was just such an essential first step in the development and delivery of Service Model 1.0. Our focused efforts to understand the scale and scope of these challenges really helped us craft guiding principles for our work by ensuring that we target the locations where services needed most, the right locations, we will achieve an equitable outcome where services are properly aligned with needs and not necessarily where complaints are most prominent or powerful. By determining the right service or level of service, be it low, medium, or high touch, we will achieve an effective outcome where conditions have improved for all San Jose residents. And by determining determining and delivering the right frequency of service, we will maximize the efficiency of this program, which when combined, all lead to a clean city. You've also seen this slide before, which represents our service model in practice. You'll recall we've broken the homeless encampment trash program into three general tiers of service. Starting from the top, tier one represents sites that generally require lower levels of service to maintain good conditions and are less complicated when compared with other sites. As a result, the services provided in this tier are cheaper than the other tiers listed below. Tier two routes are located on our trails and are generally more complicated than our tier one routes because they're harder to reach and require more specialized equipment. San Jose Conservation Corps provides services to these routes, which are more expensive than tier one, but less costly than tier three, and this has largely been effective so far. Tier three sites and routes require the highest level of service because they have generally more complicated and uh, more people than sites and routes uh, one and two below, listed above. These sites often require higher engagement with residents and more dedicated time to provide the cleanup services. For that reason, they're the most expensive of our three tiers. You see the feedback loop on the left presented co contemplates the possibility of sites improving to the point where they may move up a service tier and require less costly and involved services. But we are too early in the operational phase of this model to conclude whether we can expect to see significant shifts like this. The newly developed dashboard here represents a collaborative and intensive effort of our branch with partners in public works and DOT. The objective is to provide management staff with the appropriate tools to monitor performance information, view photos and service dates, and make necessary corrections when issues arise. I will briefly pass this over to Sarah Zarate, our planning chief, to provide a demonstration and walkthrough of this platform. Sarah? Thank you, Rick. Good morning, Mayor, Council members, and members of the public. I'll be walking you through uh, the system that's in its development phase and help support our understanding of where encampments are located, their conditions, and the services that they're being provided. At the center of this dashboard, we have a more sophisticated version of the map we previewed for all of you back in October. This is essentially the repository of all the service data that's being collected. The data in each of the trash bag icons help support all of the data surrounding the map that is updated in real time. At the top of the map, we built a filtering system that lets us look at information during a specific time frame. You'll notice that if I click on a particular time frame, it'll change some of the metrics around it. To the right, I can see how many trash surveys or encampment assessments have been conducted during that period of time. You'll notice that if I click on, uh, on these arrows, I can go back and forth through, through different information. Uh, below it, I have information specific to what's contained within uh, the icons above. For example, Yesterday, the teams were at Mayberry Road near Berryessa and Commercial. If I click on the icon, I will get additional information related to the trash service delivery, including pictures of the service that was provided. And I've downloaded these in advance so that you can see what this particular location looked like. And this is the after photo for when the job was completed. The same information can be seen for the encampment assessments, which we use to verify new encampments or encampments that have become inactive. 
To the left of the map and along the bottom, I have a lot of information related to hazards. For example, along the bottom, we have right of way issues that have been verified. We also track information related to individuals who voluntarily move, voluntarily move during trash collection. Along the top, we track a few different data points, including uh, bio waste, if there's any burnt down encampments. We've been tracking inactive encampments. We're building out our system for external jurisdictions. And importantly, any new encampments that are verified through the encampment assessment process. The locations here in the new, new active and unassigned encampments help provide program management staff with the information they need to make determinations on new encampments that may require service. Lastly, to the left, we're trying to develop an early warning system where we'll easily be able to identify if an encampment was scheduled for service, but did not receive service within the last two weeks. This section is perhaps the trickiest as there may be many reasons for missed service, including that team members visited the site, but did not deliver service for safety reasons, or that an encampment has become inactive. We can filter this information by zone as well. Again, the goal here is to build a system that gives program management staff a high level view of what is occurring across the city highlighting issues that need attention so that they can be appropriately addressed within the system. We've come a long way from a data standpoint since we last presented in September. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Rick to walk you through how we got here in building Service Model 1.0. Thank you, Sarah. And I wanna reemphasize Sarah's points. You saw those earlier slides with the six disparate data sets and dots all over the city. This represented a substantial effort of in-house staff in a very short period of time to develop and deliver this dashboard as a very useful tool for our field staff. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Back, to, back on slide 19, I showed a high level timeline with our operational phases bringing us to today. You can see here the second column of phase two represents the standing up of this EOC branch in June. And you can follow along with the general actions we took. In late July, early August, we transitioned to phase three of our operations, which were the initial stage of service model 1.0. I'll discuss several of the milestones in more detail, but we rolled out the services as quickly and efficiently as we could, leading to phase four, which really began with your award of the $3 million purchase orders in late October. Our tier three vendors have been deployed since October 26th, working throughout the city as we continue to deliver, document, learn, and modify our services as needed. As we transition from the activation of this branch to the initial services provided under Model 1.0, one of the first things we did was establish grant agreements with nonprofit partners to manage services along the 48 tier one and two routes crafted with a mixture of data, field observations, and our staff knowledge and experience. The output of these efforts was substantial with over 230 services to these routes since August. And you can see the breakdown by the provider shown, which resulted in resulting in the distribution of 900 trash bags the collection of 966 trash bags filled by homeless residents, the filling and removal of nearly 5,200 bags by provider and city staff, and the engagement of over 240 homeless residents with the goal of increasing the amount of trash bagged by the residents and decreasing the amount of higher touch pickup work required by our providers. The service also resulted in the employment of current or ho formerly homeless community members. This slide, excuse me, this slide shows our tier one routes in action. The collection and consolidation ba of bags at the site makes for more efficient and timely service by the providers who then only need to load and remove the bags. But our vendors and staff do have to provide cleanup services as indicated on the photos to the left. Nevertheless, as we will discuss later, we believe that a tiered service model that attempts to align vendor capabilities with realities in the field holds a lot of promise. This slide shows San Jose Conservation Corps efforts on November 12th on Guadalupe Trail. They regularly service routes in the tier two category and early indications show that they are well equipped to provide this work and have done so effectively. So before we move ahead, we'll be talking a lot about tonnage and trash today and it's fair to wonder, what does an actual ton of trash signify? Well, a ton of trash is equivalent to one small car, specifically a 1979 VW Beetle. 
Every time we say a ton of trash, keep this in mind. We'll be coming back to it. As we rolled out tiers one and two, we also rapidly deployed five dumpsters at larger encampments. We quickly determined that these were utilized, cost effective, and easy to service, so we deployed a total of 24 dumpsters at 13 locations throughout the city. Most are serviced two to three times per week, and we estimate that they have resulted in the collection of over 375 tons of trash that never had the opportunity to get in our streets. We also piloted a mobile trash service meant for sites where dumpster deployment was not possible, but encampments and trash services are necessary. We leveraged a provision in an existing city waste hauling agreement with Green Team to provide services to 23 sites throughout the city performed by two crews every Saturday. This has resulted in an additional 55 tons of collected and disposed trash at encampments since September. So as we rolled out services in our initial phase of operations, we had generally established the right locations, which resulted in our three tiered model. Our most significant operational challenge yet was how to tackle the largest and most complicated sites, always keeping in mind that our objective is to provide services to and for people. What you see on the upper right photo was the result of a collaboration with the planning and operational branches of our team in using existing data, field conditions, and expected work required to provide satisfactory service. The three geographic zones you see in, in, that, in that photo reflect an effort to equitably assign services and frequencies to ensure good outcomes throughout the city. These efforts are still very much in development mode, but the principles of right, uh, but the principles of right location, right service, right frequency, leading to equitable, effective, and efficient outcomes very much guide our work and will continue to do so as we move forward. You awarded $3 million per, of purchase orders to three vendors in October 20th. And in a parallel effort, the city manager directed departments to redeploy staff members to help facilitate, manage, and perform field work. As a result of these joint efforts, a full service model 1.0 rolled out on October 26. Since October 26, our teams and vendors have performed over 300 cleanups and trash pickups been counting, collected 200 VW Beetle, I mean trash, tons of trash, and endeavor to meet our preliminary performance target of service provided every two weeks. This slide shows the spectrum of tier three service cleanups. Whereas a site on the left required far less substantial work than the site on the right, the end result for both is the same, a dramatically cleaner site. These photos and service dates were pulled directly from the dashboard Sarah, Sarah showed you and are a result of the diligent documentation of our existing and redeployed field staff who enter this data and all these photos on tablets or smartphones in the field and update our dashboard in real time. Here we see two more frequent flyer and identifiable sites with data pulled from our dashboard. The site on the left is Donna Lane, a tier three site that requires frequent servicing. The site on the right was an effort coordinated with Caltrans and we'll discuss the disposition of our agreements and collaborative efforts with other agencies later in the presentation. With that, and with great gratitude to the leadership and staff who supported these efforts, I will pass the presentation on to Sarah Zarate, our branch planning chief to discuss our encampment protocols and implementations. Sarah. Thanks, Rick. A lot of operational pieces have come together to support waste removal at encampments. In addition to the resources already described, our branch also developed a protocol framework to support the dynamic conditions that crews face in the field. Providing trash service to our unsheltered population doesn't follow the same linear process that we experience in our homes. There are many challenges associated with ser serving this population. The term homeless has the effect of homogenizing a very diverse group. Although providing these residents trash services may actually require very different tools and tactics depending on the encampment. What we've experienced is that our engagement strategy requires a continuum, including cooperative strategies and supports and increasing interventions depending on encampment conditions which may, in exceptional circumstances, lead to encampment abatements. Since July, our branch has developed protocols for our program management and field staff to better understand the parameters under which they're working, and especially to clarify some of the ambiguities pertaining to this balance between supporting public health at the population level and maintaining the safety of communities at a very local level. Our existing manual consists of three protocols and will continue to evolve as needed. Importantly, they're all grounded in our public health approach, 
meaning we foreground our actions with the understanding that we're working with a vulnerable population that on average already has poor health outcomes and that contracting COVID could result in severe illness. Our goal is to reach our, unintent our intended outcomes collaboratively and voluntarily. One protocol creates exceptions to abatement suspensions in the public right of way. It outlines what is considered the public right of way and the actions that the city will take to mitigate any public safety hazards. The multidisciplinary assessment and intervention team protocol addresses the need for escalated interventions at certain encampments by developing various deploying various subject matter experts to access locations and make recommendations to improve encampment conditions. Lastly, the escalated cleanup protocol recognizes that despite repeated attempts to gain voluntary cooperation, there are residents refusing to dispose of trash and in some instances claim what is objectively trash as personal property to avoid cleanup. This protocol provides a clear process to remove the trash, but allow encampment residents to remain sheltering in place. Since late July, we've confirmed about 130 right-of-way impediments. Many are repeat issues. About half of these have required abatement posting to clear the hazard. Importantly, while this protocol provides field crews with the tools needed to address the immediate hazard, the root cause issue related to unsheltered homelessness and in some instances, behavioral health issues go unresolved despite many outreach attempts. This means the problem is generally moved down the road to be addressed through escalated measures another day. I'll show an example of this on the next slide. As described in the November info memo, we're piloting the multidisciplinary team at five encampment sites. Our housing department is helping coordinate many departments and agencies. The five sites include Felipe, Component Drive, Coyote Creek at Roberts Ave, Coyote Creek at Rock Springs, and Selma Olander. Various disciplines have already completed their initial assessments and have made recommendations. Lastly, we conducted over 30 escalated cleanups and we'll continue to deploy this resource as needed to reduce trash at uncooperative sites. The picture on the right shows our new escalated cleanup posting. It's translated in three languages and attempts to communicate the conditions we're trying to achieve through a more visual approach. This here is an example of a right of way posting and cleaning. This location had one resident. On the one hand, the city team and vendor worked very efficiently to clean and clear the right-of-way hazard, an action that was required, and they did so with an empathetic approach, considering the difficulty of the task. This is truly a heart-wrenching activity to watch. And in the end, the team has accomplished the task at hand, but the problem has just moved down the street, as you can tell with the arrows. Luckily, in this instance, one of the city's outreach teams arrived seamlessly to follow up with the client and offer housing and supports. And lastly, here we have an example of what we mean by an escalated cleaning. This particular encampment is under the 87-280 interchange, and as can be seen, can be quite expansive. In the end, once the cleaning is completed, the tents and the people will remain, as can be seen in the bottom picture. And with that, I'll turn it over to Olympia to walk you through the ancillary efforts related to other blight removal and interagency collaboration that's occurring in parallel to the encampment trash program. Thank you, Sarah. While the anti-litter program and activities were suspended during the shelter in place, the anti-graffiti program services continued to operate. One of the most notable incidents or activities that we completed was abating over 96,000 square feet of graffiti on both public and private property during the civil unrest downtown in late May. When the anti-litter program was initially suspended, the staff transitioned to providing trash services at encampments. Once the program was able to secure additional staffing and vendor support, 
the teams were able to refocus efforts on core anti-litter programs. Working initially started with our Creek Cleanup Partners, South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition and Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. Those programs restarted in October 20, 2020. Volunteers were able to remove over 46 tons of trash. Also, our Neighborhood Dumpster Day program was able to restart. We escalated cleanups quickly, working nearly every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to do dumpster day events, collecting over 405 tons of debris. Our neighborhood volunteer program has recently restarted as well. Neighborhood and business associations have started to coordinate and collaborate litter events throughout the city. Next slide, please. One of our new, one of our new litter programs that I would like to highlight is Cash for Trash. The program was initially launched in February 2020, but was halted due to the shelter in place. The program just recently relaunched in November. The program is the first in the nation to place a redemption value on trash located at encampments. The program works by providing a $4 redemption value for a bag of trash that residents collect at their encamped location. Residents can submit up to five bags of trash for a maximum of $20. MasterCard is a critical partner in this program. They provide a reloadable MasterCard that program participants receive, ensuring that funds are immediately available for use. By partnering with MasterCard, we are also able to provide access to banking services for our unhoused population. The initial pilot program, the initial phase of this program will enroll 400 participants at 41 locations throughout the city. Currently, we have over 69 participants enrolled and they've collected a little over 10 tons of trash. During the COVID-19 response, the RAPID team was activated under the EOC Beautify SJ program to better leverage program resources to address trash and dumping throughout the city. There has been a substantial increase in the amount of dumping that has occurred in the city over the past six months, which all of us have witnessed. This increase in dumping is consistent with the experiences of other cities in the Bay Area, specifically Oakland and San Francisco, and in the state as a whole. We too in the city of San Jose have experienced a phenomenon that across the country they're referring to as COVID cleaning. But while people are at home, sheltering in place, they utilize this opportunity to remove and get rid of large bulky items, oftentimes placing them in streets or on sidewalks. In October, the green team began supporting our rapid team by picking up illegal dumping in areas most impacted in an effort to prevent those items from entering encampment locations. This additional help has allowed RAPID to increase their proactive illegal dumping pickups, especially in those areas most impacted by dumping throughout the city. Another area where the city has had challenges is in addressing blight on other jurisdictions' properties. This includes trash, illegal dumping, graffiti, and encampments. Oftentimes, other jurisdictions' rep response times and timelines to address these blight issues do not align with those of our city. To address this, the city began proactively working with those agencies that have large amounts of property within the city of San Jose, but which the city has no jurisdiction over. The Union Pacific Railroad, we know, has been an area that we've had a challenge with for quite some time. I am happy to announce that we are in the execution phase of this MOU. The city has currently started conducting several workshops with our partners in Caltrans in an effort to better understand their processes to address blight on their property. The goal is to develop a partnership agreement to better coordinate and leverage resources to address blight issues that impact both of our organizations. While we are in the process of developing a partnership agreement, the work does continue. Caltrans and the city have coordinated several cleanups including one at 85 in Almaden, one at Meridian, and on the on-ramps and off-ramps at Story Road in 101. The city currently does have an MOA with our partner, um, Valley Water. However, this MOA focuses on encampment abatement activities. We are currently in the process of finalizing a side letter in an effort to better um, respond to cleanup efforts during COVID-19. The city will begin proactive conversations to develop partnership agreements with the county, VTA, and PG&E in 2021. 
please note that the city does continue to coordinate and collaborate cleanup activities with these organizations as we develop partnership agreements. The city has been working with Union Pacific Railroad for about 18 months to develop an MOU that would achieve the goals of both agencies. During this process, the city and Union Pacific has coordinated several cleanup activities along the rail line and other Union Pacific properties. Specifically, we've conducted about four cleanups since April. In the MOU though, there are several areas that we would like to highlight. We will be conducting at least eight joint cleanups per calendar year, develop a quarterly cleanup coordination plan, ensure that our city outreach workers have access to engage and work with people who are residing in encampments along rail property, and Union Pacific has agreed to install and maintain no trespassing and no dumping signs on their property. One coordinated cleanup that I would like to highlight is what the staff has dubbed the Mad Max cleanup that occurred at Monterey and Model Road in Bailey. The city and Union Pacific Railroad working in coordination and collaborating removed over 400 tons of trash and debris from this dump site in South San Jose. There were 22 abandoned vehicles that needed to be removed, including two that we were able to return to their owners. Trees and vegetation was maintained so that we get a better line of sight in the effort to reduce additional and future dumping. We also closed off the access to a model road, which we hope will reduce future incidents of dumping in the area. Both Union Pacific Railroad and the Beautify SJ team monitor the site weekly and quickly address any illegal dumping that occurs on the property. The city and Caltrans began meeting and working together in October 2020 to discuss how we could best partner to leverage resources to address blight issues that impact both the city and Caltrans. Our meetings have really focused on mapping our properties so that we understand who owns what and which jurisdiction is ultimately responsible for its maintenance, prioritizing areas that we need to clean, identifying gaps in service protocols, as this can help both of our agencies better respond to issues that occur, and really focus in on developing a partnership agreement that responds to current issues that are occurring um, at this time. Many of our current contracts are dated in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, which oftentimes makes it difficult to coordinate and complete work that needs to take place. Here is an example of the city and Caltrans coordinated cleanup that occurred at 85 in Alma Dent. As a reminder, encampments can only be removed from areas of Caltrans property if they are approved via the Office of Emergency Services in the governor's office. Only those encampments posing a safety hazard are abated and removed at this time. This is a cleanup that occurred in which city and Caltrans staff worked together to remove over 16 tons of debris, address eight abandoned vehicles, abandoned and inoperable vehicles that were at the site. It's important to note that both our outreach teams, the Beautify SJ team, and Caltrans visited the site on a regular basis for nine weeks in an effort to have residents accept services. There were 14 individuals who were encamped at the site. 12 of the individuals did accept services. Two individuals currently remain. But I would like to caution us and remind people that we do expect that people will return to this site. The city will continue to work with Caltrans in an effort though to keep it clean. I will now turn it over to Sarah to discuss what we have learned about the program. Thank you, Olympia. Since mid-June, this branch has aggressively scaled its efforts to build a program not tried before, a systematic trash service for homeless residents. So what have we learned? Perhaps most importantly, capacity matters. As was described earlier by Rick, this program became fully operational at the end of October, when we were able to significantly scale the size of our field teams and vendor capacity. This is what we refer to as phase four. October 26 offers a clear point of demarcation in service delivery. To understand the impact, we analyze a four-week period just prior to phase four, the yellow, 
the light yellow bars and compared it to the four week period following the added capacity, the green bars. The change was significant. Our trash collection increased fourfold. The number of locations receiving service more than doubled and the tons of trash and debris collected increased over threefold. So finding number one is that adding resources and creating zones that allow staff and vendors to target their attention results in significant increases in services. Our guiding framework for building a program is to identify the right locations and provide residents living there the right service at the right frequency. Those program objectives were used for a baseline evaluation conducted in October, where we deployed field staff to visually assess encampments and rate them based on six indicators. In regard to locations, we found that 84% scheduled for trash service had encampments present, meaning our mapping and data system is working. In regard to right service and right frequency, only 12% met all of our indicators of no bulky items, no scattered trash, no excessive trash piles, and having trash bags visible. This number wasn't particularly surprising considering the baseline was conducted at the same time additional staff and vendors were just coming on board. Importantly, we learned great information through the underlying indicators that could help us further target some of our protocols to make improvements over the next quarter. For example, the locations identified as having excessive amounts of trash may be prioritized for escalated cleanups. Additionally, areas with bulky items were associated with illegal dumping nearby, providing us insights for illegal dumping removal and enforcement. Lastly, there's a major assumption being made that if you create this type of program, people will participate, regardless of previous experiences with city government, including abatement displacements. Nevertheless, we estimate about 60% of encampments are seemingly participating, which is a really good starting point. These summary statistics offer a program baseline. They do not offer insights into program impact yet. Benchmarks will be set using baseline data and another round of evaluations will be conducted in the coming quarter to understand impacts of being fully operational. We've learned other insights from our service delivery. For example, dumpsters are an effective tool for waste disposal. They're not labor intensive, they are cost effective, and we can easily adjust the level of service to meet the needs. And many of the problems anticipated with the dumpsters did not generally materialize. Some of the locations selected had existing issues with illegal dumping. These continued, albeit some of the dumping actually ended up in the dumpsters, which was a silver lining. We also believe that the tiered system offers a promising program approach. The sites categorized for tier one and two seem to have been correctly assigned for services based on their November visual assessments indicating that they are currently receiving the right service. We did encounter some challenges along the way, matching provider work models with our program model that demands schedule and staffing stability. We'll continue to fine tune those in the next quarter. As I described a few slides ago, the tier three scaled model significantly increased service output. And in regard to frequency, perhaps unsurprising to you, but important to note from an evaluative perspective, service frequency matters. Our visual assessments showed that there was a difference in site conditions based on the level of service frequency received, with sites receiving only one trash service per month having worse conditions than those receiving two or more. We've also gained broader insights. Using our RFB as an indicator, the private sector was not exactly prepared for this type of program, and the city is driving the market. Vendors appeared prepared to execute traditional abatements, but were less prepared to deploy scheduled trash service delivery. We think it will take time for the private sector to adjust. In regard to housing and shelter, we believe trash service for our unsheltered residents is a necessary 
but not sufficient service to address issues of cleanliness in the city. As demonstrated through the right-of-way example, even if we are successful in meeting an objective of cleanliness today, the underlying cause of that particular blight source, people living outdoors, remains unresolved. Serving vehicles through the service model will continue to be challenging, even in shelter in place conditions. It works for some and doesn't work for others. We'll need to continue refining approaches for this particular subpopulation. And lastly, we will continue to have a trash versus property dilemma that is not insignificant and is complex. Many of us housed residents may drive past an encampment and wonder why homeless residents aren't collecting, are collecting so much trash. But what appears to us as trash are in fact items that have trade value in the unhoused market. This does not have an easy solution and will continue to cause conflict. And with that, I will turn it over to Neil to summarize service model 1.0 and lay our path forward. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for everything. Uh, so in summary, uh, this effort has shown great promise. As you heard, since the spring, the dedicated team behind us has mapped and identified over 150 plus sites across the city for services. They've initiated over 2,000 trash collections and removed over 2,200 tons of trash through this new service system and through our large coordinated cleanups. As stated earlier, one ton of trash is roughly equal to a small vehicle like a Volkswagen Beetle. When you look at 2,200 Volkswagen Beetles, how can we visualize this amount of trash? Tail the tip, those cars would cover 84 and one half football fields, covering over 5.75 miles. Tip to tail, you'd see 2,200 cars on Monterey Highway, stretching south from Keys to a little past Chinoweth. Tip to tail, if someone organized a classic VW car show, you'd see 2,200 Beatles from City Hall, east on Santa Clara Street, past Peter's Bakery, up to, up to the San Jose Country Club, and about a mile up Mount Hamilton Road. Tip to tail, on Highway 87 from the 280 interchange going south, your commute would be gridlocked all the way from the, to the 87 and 85 juncture. This amount of trash has been removed by our teams and vendors since the spring. So where do we go from here? We need to continue to standardize and, and integrate what we have had been learning in Service Model 1.0 and find the efficiencies and effectiveness within our tiered service models through the end of this fiscal year. For example, we brought on board vendors, we've modified services, locations and routes as we match resources and equipment with the fiscal challenges of in cleaning an encampment. One way trail segments, the inability to bring heavy equipment down steep embankments. Uh, this type of site specific data is continually reviewed and monitored, monitored for us to make these ongoing system improvements. We wanna refine and optimize our staffing models for long-term solutions monitor the work of our vendors, keep measuring and evaluating our services, and continue piloting new ideas, such as a dumpster roll-up program that is shown to be a lower cost service and has been utilized by our homeless residents to maintain a greater level of cleanliness. We want to continue the Cash for Trash pilot program in partnership with MasterCard, which again provides up to 400 individuals to get $4 per bag to help them with their basic necessities. Again, this pile is being rolled out at 41 selected sites. This is an iterative process. We found that we could, we could further refine and optimize this. As a new and unique service line, we are beginning to learn that some of our partners and vendors may not align with the roles that they've been assigned. We've learned a lot about the staffing it takes to manage this work, and we will seek to refine and modify roles, responsibilities, and staffing levels to move us to the positive outcomes. We are committed to using this data and analysis to ensure that we are providing equitable services. We want to ensure that we are not just responding to the most complaints, but within a system that we know has been identified as the right location, provided the right service and the right frequency so that we are cleaning up neighborhoods who need it the most. And this takes us to our next phase, which is building service model 2.0, a long-term strategy, a refined service model 
an appropriately resourced operational program. You've seen the slide before as the development of Service Model 2.0 was identified as our strategic goal three that will take us through next fiscal year. We knew that services that we started earlier this summer, if successful, would need to be quickly assessed, evaluated, and developed into an ongoing service plan and roadmap. As you've seen, the complex efforts required us to take a broader look at what Beautify San Jose should be. We'll be looking to move from collection of inputs and outputs and move toward programmatic and community-wide outcomes. In fact, we've already commenced our work on Service Model 2.0 by gathering leadership of the Beautify San Jose partner departments in multiple short workshops with the objective of coming up with a common vision and mission for this organization. What you see here is the first deliverable of that work with much more to come in the second half of the calendar year. The team will be focused on implementing our vision and mission of a broader Beautify San Jose system. We want San Jose residents to be engaged and proud of their clean and beautiful city we want to equitably prevent and remove blight to cultivate clean and beautiful neighborhoods. Our immediate actions going into January through June of 2021 will be to refine our staffing model in alignment with the EOC, evaluate and, and extend our service contracts for tiers one through three to those vendors who are providing us a high level of performance and package our learning into a budget proposal for fiscal year 21-22. What we are currently seeing that is needed to be successful is a cross-departmental, cross-departmental, cross-jurisdictional, high-functioning work team that allows us to coordinate city, resident, nonprofit, and private sector services for a cleaner San Jose. Operating in a continuum of services from community engagement and education to response and maintenance through enforcement, we will need strong operational service units focusing on our existing and emerging work, including the encampment trash pickup, the illegal dumping, anti litter, anti graffiti, interagency coordination. We will need to maintain and grow the data, mapping, analysis, and evaluation efforts that we have built. We need to establish and commit to communication, education, enforcement because we need changed behavior, we need to change the behaviors and not just chase the problems. And of course, we need to continue with partnering and aligning human-centered philosophies with city leaders like Jackie and Reagan in housing to align our work with their continued efforts to end homelessness. I now would like to turn the presentation back over to Jim to discuss our Beautify San Jose roadmap and how we align within the citywide roadmap overall. Great, thanks, Neil. So we're almost done. We just have a few more slides to wrap up. But on November 17th, staff was presented, or staff presented a high-level citywide roadmap to the council to identify priority work efforts for the remainder of 2021 for the best use of limited staff resources. On the slide, you can see two priorities and two projects that are outlined in green that focus on sheltering and encampment services and the Beautify SJ waste pickup strategy. Two small boxes on this slide represents a large body of work that will become apparent on the next slide, please. So based upon the work of the Beautify SJ response branch and the priority identified in the citywide roadmap, a preliminary Beautify SJ roadmap has been developed for 2021. The seven priority areas in the left column identify the functional areas on the Beautify SJ concept organization chart that Neil just presented a few slides back. The projects identified within the priority areas represent essential work that needs to be completed to ultimately achieve the goals in the branch of an equitable, effective, and efficient program. For example, we've highlighted a few of the priority roadmap items on the slide, including program assessments that need to be completed for the non-encampment service areas of Beautify SJ, like illegal dumping pickup and the anti-litter programs, while what much work remains in the encampment trash area in terms of workflow, 
protocol development, refinement, and scheduling. Further data system development across the board is needed as well. And the interrelationship between housing and shelter outreach and its efficacy in sheltering and serving people and encampment organizing around better trash containment by those living in encampments needs further development and evaluation as well. The 2021 Beautify SJ Roadmap represents a large body of work that must be addressed in a meaningful way if better, more consistent results are to be achieved and the most equitable and efficient allocation of resource is to be realized as well. So the topic of moving from measuring outputs like the number of tons picked up or graffiti cleaned or service requests completed or volunteer hours to measuring performance outcomes, a clean city is such an important part of ultimately achieving program success that it deserves a slide of its own. The first set of guiding principles we adopted was to identify and measure whether we were servicing the right locations with the right service frequency. We recognize this is a first yet necessary step towards outcome because to measure outcomes alone, visually clean conditions does not provide enough work process and production information to determine if the program is working in an equitable, effective and efficient manager. This was the right first step and a necessary first step. We've also initiated the development of an evaluative framework for the encampment trash program that visually measures the presence of bulky items, scattered trash, and the volume of trash in encampments. A baseline survey was conducted in November, as you heard before. So encampment organizing efforts are aimed at having encampment residents contain their trash, keep it in designated locations, and ideally bag it or put it in one of the deployed dumpsters. This is a precursor to visually rating enough physical area of the city to make both localized and broad assessments of the cleanliness of the city, which is the ultimate goal. We also recognize that the Beautify SJ program is reliant on other program successes, such as homeless and shelter outreach, county behavioral health services, and education and enforcement of illegal dumping. The bottom line though, visually clean conditions across the city is the true outcome trying to be achieved. And the measurement system being developed aims to do just that in 2021. So much work has been produced and accomplished by the Beautify SJ branch in 2020 under the most challenging of conditions. Progress is being made. We have a systematic approach that is moving from early pilot to more mainstream to address encampment trash but we recognize that much work is still to be done. We still need to get conditions much cleaner and much refinement lies ahead. We recognize that and we're ready to address that in 2021. But with service model 1.0 rolled out, we're starting to tabulate the actual costs compared to budget estimates. We're refining those cost estimates for the January to June timeframe to continue current service levels and we expect conditions to approve because we've just initiated this work. We're not at peak productivity and we think these services will start to have a cumulative beneficial effect and will enable us to prepare budget and service proposals for the 21-22 budget. We intend to continue to deliver zone-based encampment trash services. We'll consider extensions to some of the city staff EOC redeployments used to manage the vendors, conduct the evaluations and support encampment organizing as needed. Decisions need to be made on transitioning the collection of programs and services in the Beautify SJ EOC branch into a more normalized PRNS department Beautify SJ program. We'll continue to implement and refine the encampment protocols developed and launched in the last half of 2020. And finally, as resources are available, we need to advance an education and enforcement strategy, finalize and implement a full complement of interagency agreements, and work on refining and collaborating further with housing encampment outreach and county behavioral health services. 
So the title of this next slide is a bureaucratic mouthful, so I won't attempt it. What I will do is convey my deepest appreciation to many city employees who have done their absolute best under the most difficult of circumstances to address these crises. You can see the core EOC team on their daily Zoom meeting in the picture on the left. They led, scoped, developed and implemented a major EOC response for which you have heard about the early results this morning. And I am so grateful to this team. At times I pushed them, challenged them, appealed to them and encouraged them. And they met my expectations each and every time. Equally as important and impressive and pictured on the right is the field team from the departments across the city, led by PRNS, DOT, ESD, housing, airport, PBCE, and public works. Many were redeployed to new assignments and received training outside in a socially distanced and safe manner and went right to work. Usually there are too many names to name on a project like this. So if we listed all the names on the slide, but in this case, I would be remiss if I didn't call out those pictured in the top row of the Zoom meeting. Your presenters today, Olympia Williams, Sarah Zarate, Neil Rufino, and Rick Scott. They were the driving force behind the EOC branch as its co-directors and the operations and planning directors. And there's one last person to recognize and that's Sarah Steele the assistant to the operations coordinator. She's my assistant. She's been the constant uh, through the entire pandemic, covering so many things, including serving as this branch's procurement and personnel officer. She has worked tirelessly since the pandemic hit in March. And with that, uh, we're complete with our presentation. We truly appreciate the council's patience and attention on this challenging and complex topic and are available for your questions, feedback and guidance and to receive comments from the public as well. So Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Mayor, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I've got a phone and computer running at the same time because apparently my audio isn't working on one device. So uh, thanks everybody uh, for the extraordinarily great work. Uh, in a very, very difficult situation. I think we all recognize that uh, you guys rushed into a situation that was very chaotic and you're rapidly trying to make um, it uh, orderly and intelligible. And I think we've made uh, incredible strides in a short period of time, given how everything had to shut down uh, so severely back in March. Let's go to our community first, and then we're gonna come back to the council for questions. Uh, Steve Holmes, thank you, Steve, for all of your partnership. Steve, your device is still muted. There you go. Steve, welcome. You able to hear us? Steve, we're not able to hear you right now. I'm not sure if it's because you have an older version of... Um, no, Mayor, he's Zoom. up to date, but we can come back to him and see. Okay, Steve, keep your hand up. Uh, see if we can fiddle with your device. We'll come right back to you. Uh, and Justin Imamura, thank you, Justin, for all the extraordinary work that you do, both for the city and uh, in your uh, not so leisurely time with the trash punks. Justin? Hello, Council, and thank you so much for just all your support uh, with the trash punks this year. We were able to pivot big time and uh, do everything super safe. Um, I just wanted to uh, just acknowledge uh, council members that have supported us uh, through cleaning up as well as Olympia and her team. And uh, you know, as you look forward to the future in 2021, please, as you are doing already, support groups like us, Steve's group, Deb's group. Uh, we need hundreds of these groups to clean up uh, the city of San Jose and beyond. And uh, we just acknowledge our Thanksgiving to y'all. I know it's a really difficult time with everything that's going on. And uh, as the founder of the Trash Bunks, I do my best to support the volunteers and the community in a positive way. And, um, and, and we just really appreciate everything that you do. 
So if you can continue to supporting groups like ourselves, uh, we really appreciate that with uh, PPE, litter sticks, trash bags, and uh, just you know keep hiring awesome people that work for uh, Olympia's team. So thank you so much, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Justin. Thank you to you. Uh, as you mentioned, Steve Holmes, Deb Kramer, uh, you guys have really leveraged the energy and, and time of thousands of volunteers uh, to be able to be part of the solution. Really grateful uh, to you for all your hard work. Steve, I see you got a couple of hands up. If one of those will work, we'll go with either one. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Thanks. The beauty of Zoom. Thank you. Um, over the past several years, I've attended these meetings and I've raised a simple question. Are we winning the war on trash in our city? I can't speak about conditions along our streets and parks, but I can regarding local creeks. Over the past seven and a half years, South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition has worked tirelessly trying to reclaim our polluted waterways. Sometime over the next six months, we will surpass the 1 million pound milestone. Since our relaunch during these COVID times in May, we have conducted 27 cleanups and we've removed 48 tons of trash. We can't clean our way out of this situation. Other cities like Sacramento and recently Oakland are enacting ordinances to protect critical infrastructure by not allowing camping along their waterways within 25 feet of the levees. Individual camp sizes have been defined as 12 by 12 spaces to prevent camps from exploding in size. I would further recommend that a portion of the new housing units be set aside to create a path for these unhoused to move from what are essentially squalor conditions along our creeks. I want to thank council for past BD funding and small grants from several of the council members, but our main source of funding through the Baykeepers Consent Decree will twilight on June 30th. As council delves into programs that are making a difference, I would ask that the funding be set aside to support grassroots groups like the Trash Punks, Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, and South Bay Clean Creeks Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Gail Osmer. Good morning, it's still morning. Um, I just wanna thank Olympia and all her group for all the wonderful work they have done um, I know most of you mainly just care about the cleanups and um, sorry to say, but maybe not the people so much. Um, I know I have a big disagreement with all of you about the CDC guidelines and your abatement of Roberts. I, I can't even believe for a minute that th this trail is gonna start in the midst of this pandemic. I know they, they have abated people. I know some people were abated on Donna Lane and um, everything has been kind of up in the air as you all know, but let me tell you, there is no services. People do not go out and offer services. There's no services, no place for the folks to go. They don't want to go into a shelter. Look at what just happened at Little Orchard in the blue tent. They have an outbreak. People living in encampments have been safe. Please do not do any more abatements. This is um, really against the CDC guidelines. And um, I think you need to also look into the services you're using. Um, at Roberts, there was a woman with kids and um, who's the one that got him into housing? Myself, who's the one that pushed to get him into housing? Services are not doing their job, which means home first, they're not doing their job. And um, more and more people are falling through the cracks and um, we're gonna have more deaths because there's no place for people to go. Nothing is being open and we should have the Tully library open, but Maya doesn't want that to happen and people are gonna be dying. But thank you for letting me speak and have a good day. Thank you. Uh, Deb Kramer. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak before the council. My name is Deb Kramer. I'm the executive director with Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. And first I'd like to thank the Beautify SJ support to help Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful work to keep the trails and creek clean. Um, through Olympia Williams and her staff at Anti-Litters Direct Support, 
we have been able to give litter kits to many residents who say how they use the litter kits in their neighborhoods, which I'm um, again trying to support. This has been a really great opportunity for neighbors to take responsibility for their own in environment. Um, I also want to thank Council Member Esparza and the city management team for the support of our efforts. We've been able to work with the homeless people who we encounter along the Coyote Creek Trail who have bagged their trash and added them to our two tons of trash that our small groups of volunteers remove each week. However, I also agree with Steve Holmes in that the efforts that the city of Oakland have made to try to build a 12 foot radius of um, not having encampments near businesses and waterways in particular is something that I really encourage the council to take up as a uh, opportunity. So thanks again for all your support and um, I'm really grateful for the work that uh, Beautify SJ and the small staff are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And again, thank you for all of your work. Okay, uh, returning to the council, I, I want to just lead off with a couple uh, questions because I know you know, we got pretty far behind all this when the pandemic hit and we had to shut everything down. And, and Dave, you know, we've had a lot of discussions as far back as March, I think, about, you know, what's an essential service and what's not. I think it's clear our residents believe this is really, really important. Um, and the question is, if there is a, I think we all expect there's going to be another stay home mandate. Uh, when exactly that will be, whether it's uh, tomorrow or or a a week and a half or three weeks from now, I think we know it's coming. Uh, will many of these cleanup activities continue to be essential services for the city? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And um, yeah, I think I think they will. You know, certainly, uh, we've learned a lot over the past many months. Um, you know, this this whole strategy that we've developed is a people first strategy. Um, abatement is a last resort. Uh, but just like we never discontinued garbage service to all of our housed residents, now that we've established, um, you know, encampment trash service, if you will, uh, to our unhoused residents, I, I don't think we have any intention of stopping that. I, I think it is now an essential service that we've developed. And um, I think it meets all those goals, um, no matter really, I think, whatever the future county guidelines um, or orders, uh, I think we would be able to maintain this service would be what would be my opinion. I know Jim, if you agree with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Dave. And I think we we have the safety protocols for our employees as well. So I think we have a, a level of confidence that we can do it safely and and we, we would agree deem it essential. Great, uh, that's encouraging because I know it's, it's awfully hard to, to get to this point uh, if there's more backsliding and we know that you guys had to do an awful lot of catching up just to get here. Um, Jim, I really appreciate the, the attention you gave toward the end of the presentation around moving from measuring outputs to measuring outcomes. Certainly uh, impressive number of 2200 Volkswagen bugs uh, that are, are lined up. Um, all that is um, meaningful to give all of us a clear sense of just how much work is being done out there. Uh, but we know our residents care more about uh, the condition of their community. And is this going to look something like a, a color coding, a, a letter format? I mean, how can you give us a sense of just what it's going to appear like to a resident? And are we going to be doing something on a, a dashboard of some kind? What do you think this looks like to a typical resident when we're able to get it in place? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question, Mayor. Uh, I'll I'll be upfront with you. I don't know that I have the, the kind of the dashboard view of what what we ultimately think it will look like. Um, I think we have focused our effort, I think, on the the foundational and the precursor steps. Sarah went through that we literally were going out to encampments and locations. And assessing, you know, what they look like from the standpoint of, do we have bulky items, scattered trash, bag trash? We will ultimately build into that kind of a, a rating and evaluation to say, do we have clean conditions? You know, right. What does it look like to the to the eye? Uh, what does it look like in the picture? You can tell we're taking pictures of all these locations before and after, so we will have a continuous record. 
And then I think ultimately we do have to figure out what, what is the, the practical accessible dashboard type thing that we can do. So I think we'll look at those things, but what we've, what we've tried to do is build the foundational elements that must underpin any system so that ultimately the showy stuff at the top is not, you know, is not, you know, a house of cards, if you will, not supported by a foundational system where we know the data, we know it's accurate, and we know what we're reporting is, can be confirmed in ground truth with hard data. And, and so we'll work to figure that out. I think on the payment maintenance system, we went to that system where we literally have every street that has the, the rating, and maybe that's kind of the, the point that you're, you're bringing up. Um, I think we have to figure out how many places do we want to display as well. I, I don't think it's every street in this instance. I think there are areas that, that maybe have more hot spot focus. Um, we'll talk with the SD. They had to do uh, citywide trash load reduction surveys as well. So, so we'll, we'll definitely build the point in question that you have into our ultimate kind of dashboard of where are we at? What, what, you know, what's the kind of the bottom line of what conditions look like across the city, but built on a strong foundation. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, I know this is not an easy thing to figure out. Um, I, I would just add, I, I think that for an awful lot of residents in our city, it's not just, say, a particular hotspot or, you know, we know encampments, obviously, we all of us as human beings produce trash. And so encampments tend to be often in those hotspots. But it, it's often just the, the scattered litter that they're seeing every day when they're driving home, right? Yeah. And so I, I hope that however we incorporate this, we're, we're recognizing that this is more than just, um, you know, the 150 spots, although obviously it's hard enough to maintain those 150. It, it uh, is, yeah, it is. The um, I, I really think, uh, really appreciate uh, Sarah's presentation on the data. I think it's really incredible how we've gotten this much up to up, up and running to try to make sense of the chaos that that had been out there, and I think we're starting to really start to get a handle on. Uh, anecdotally, visually, I think it's looking better, but I, I can only um, speak anecdotally. And and you guys have a clear sense, and our community ultimately has a clear sense. Um, I did want to ask a question about cash for trash and the bridge program. I know both of these are just small parts of the the solution. But I think really important parts, particularly because we think this could be a, a really strong pathway um, to help our unhoused neighbors get back on their feet, um, particularly the bridge program. And do we, forgive me if I missed it, because I, I got a lot of incoming texts during this presentation, but do we have any data um, about the latest, since Olympia released that memo in June, we had some data about, I think about a third of the participants that moved on to um, to other jobs, and I think another third had gotten housed. It, it, do we have any updated information about how our participants are doing the bridge program? Yeah, Olympia and Neil, if you guys could could respond to the mayor, please. Hi, Mayor. Yes, Olympia Williams. Um, we have received some data, and about fifty one percent of the people in the program at this time have either transitioned into housing or into what we call full time stable jobs. We've been collecting quite a bit of data on the demographics, where people have gone to work, what their hourly salary is. And our goal, I know my goal had been to update that when we release the next memo in the spring about SJ Bridge. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And I think it would be really helpful to have that data, um, you know, before we're actually going into budget discussions. I think, look, I, I think this is a really important and powerful tool and I'm hopeful that we can elevate that for all of us to think about as we're, we're going into the budget discussions. We know there'll be a lot of difficult choices. Um, and then uh, with regard to cash for trash, you know, as, as the presentation was going on, I was getting texts from various community members when Shiloh Ballard, you know, came up with a great idea. Um, and it's consistent with what I think was the original intent of this, which was the city pay card that MasterCards created could be a real gateway for us to help unhoused neighbors ultimately get access to health services and, and other critical needs. Um, and the fact that there's some identification, so there's ability to for folks to actually engage in transactions. 
Um, what she had suggested was getting people signed up, you know, in lifts program for um, for low income residents getting um, low cost access to the to the bike share program. Um, and I imagine both with the bridge program and cash for trash, that would seem to be a logical thing. It, is there somebody um, on the team that we can talk to about how to integrate that particular step? Because I think mobility is awfully important for, for many of these residents. Well, I, I, I would say this, Mayor, that, that, you know, I think talking with Olympia and then I think we want to bring Reagan in with, with the outreach teams, because I think we, we have to recognize that that the Beautify SJ program, I think, is is doing a lot of work. Um, it's not outreach. Clearly, right. uh, housing and shelter outreach is is done through our housing department, and we got a great partnership with them. Uh, the Beautify SJ program has stepped up though around organizing and trying to engage with people that are in in encampments to to work on a variety of fronts together to, to, to help them, to help us, and, and we'll keep doing that. But I think it's, let's figure out between the Beautify SJ program and the homeless uh, support and services branch as well. I've got two branches work closely together, they're yep. embedded with each other, and, and between them, uh, they can connect with your office to figure out how do we how do, we do that effectively and efficiently. Great, thank you. All right. Well, thanks again for all the uh, all the work. It's it's difficult and it's hard, but it's really important. So I, I know our community appreciates it. Uh, Councilmember Pross. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, echo that. I, I, this was a tremendous presentation. Uh, thank you, Jim, um, and the entire team. Um, I think it's uh, you know been a, a significant amount of work. I think one of the things. Um, that we don't recognize, uh, especially you know when you're shelter in place and you're not really traveling around, uh, you know, not even around the city, let alone the rest of, of the region or or the country. But I think to to understand that this is a phenomenon that's happening across the country. Uh, it's not just here, the city of San Jose that that we're experiencing something that it, this pandemic has brought on. Um, I think it's eye-opening, and, um, and certainly we, you know, we, we've been hearing the complaints, we've been seeing it physically with our own eyes, uh, the growing challenges, um, and and I think I want to recognize that, but I also want to dive a little deeper in regards to the what we know is the the, the crux of of a lot of these challenges, and and has we've been focused on, which is these homeless encampments, and. One thing I've been advocating for for several years is that the city explores sanctioned encampments. And what I see we've been sort of thrust into during this pandemic is, is you know, we've been now forced to just accept sanctioned encampments. And we're now providing a number of the services that sanctioned encampments uh, would require, things like trash pickup or um, a regular trash pickup in some of these cases like dumpsters hand washing sites, porter potties uh, that we've actually placed out, like for instance, um, outside of City Hall, uh, but really just trying to provide services for individuals that uh, are unsheltered. Uh, and specifically because we we don't have enough shelter to even if we wanted to, regardless of people's desire or their interest in our shelter capacity, uh, our shelter facilities, we don't have the capacity. And so, I brought this up as we started off this program, just kind of having conversations, um, Jim with yourself and Dave and some of the, the, the leadership team like Sarah. And for me, the one aspect of this that doesn't relate to what I would call sanctioned encampments by definition is identifying the, the geographic areas or the locations where they exist. Right. It, to me, it seems like that's just the one piece of, of it during this pandemic that, that we uh, are not taking advantage of. Rather, what we're doing is we're responding to any and all locations where our unhoused community decide on their own that they're going to take up an encampment. And then we're having to deploy a, a significant amount of resources um, all over the place. And we're constantly having to try to locate these these areas or uh, for those that, that may be cleared out because they are in a right of way, 
we know they're they're relocating somewhere else and and then we have a, another spot to kind of go around and and we're 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 having to seek out these areas and as we know some areas bring with them other challenges just simply because of the geographic location and uh whether it's makes it difficult to get a dumpster in there or difficult to get teams down um there are other challenges that we get because locations that are located in and off waterways, um, near homes, whatever it may be, um, fires that we've had uh, in and off the freeway. And for me, I would love to be able to, to, to take all this effort and, and take it the one step further that would be where we come in and, and now, especially that we have an idea on, on all these different locations, I'd love to get the staff's expertise and analysis on it to say, you know what, if we were to have sanctioned encampments, these are the best locations that we found that we can provide the, the, the easiest services to, um, and that don't bring with it an additional or multitude of, of, of other challenges. And, uh, and then really just identify those locations and and try to see if we couldn't get down the path of sanctioned encampments and continuing to provide these services because we know for years now we've been experiencing this this challenge and in fact it's been growing and not decreasing uh, of those uh, unsheltered in our streets i don't think we're going to turn some magical corner anytime over the next five or even ten years to to somehow eradicate homelessness and get all of our individuals that are unhoused into shelter and so we have to be realistic that this level of, of managing homelessness, of managing some of the challenges is, is going to be a reality that we have to face. And in my mind, we, I think we could do a better job at dictating how that's done. And, and one of the simplest ways is, is, is trying to, to help identify the best locations rather than just responding to wherever it is that, that somebody decides they may want to camp and, and, then, and then trying to, to allocate the services uh, to those areas, we could help identify the areas. And so I, I did want to see what sort of the, the opinion is, whether it's you, Jim, or, or some of the team, in regards to the challenges that you're facing with some of these locations to, to get all the services that we may want to get, and just your thought in regards to, it, it, do you see, as, as I do, do you also see a value in the city helping to kind of identify some of these locations versus just constantly responding to, to wherever they may pop up? Yeah, Councilor, it's an excellent question. It's kind of a key policy issue. And I, I, think, I think you should hear from a couple of us. I think, I think the city manager should, should offer his perspective and I think Jackie should offer hers as well. There are probably others that have thoughts on this, but I'll, I'll give mine initially. And, and mine is, um, from, from the, the Beautify SJ team and trying to get on this crisis of, of the trash reality, um, I think it's a major effort to figure out where we could have sanctioned encampments at, doing the policy work, the locational work. Uh, I, would, I would agree with you. We, we, we have a better handle on where people are at and, and potentially where they could go. But I also know it is not an easy process of siting, uh, whether it be transitional housing, uh, rich housing communities, emergency interim housing. Uh, you know, one other EOC branch did that work earlier in the year. I was smack in the middle of that and selecting locations was a very difficult, very time consuming process. And I can't imagine sanctioned encampments would be uh, even the same level of effort. I, I suspect it, it could be even more challenging, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go down the path of, uh, of potentially assessing that, but I think it, it would be a significant amount of work. Um, a, a couple other things, you can approach it on the continuum of, do we sanction encampments and say where it goes, or do we do more prohibition of where it can't go? Um, you know, those are two things that I think you have to consider in, in the policy continuum policy perspective, what we've started to do with the protocols that Sarah described, we've said you can't be in the right of way, which you know is probably pretty obvious, but now we're, we're actively enforcing that. Um, 
We've also done encampment containment. So we have a, an enhanced encampment cleanup. Uh, you, you saw one of the slides had the flyer of the 12 by 12. So like other cities are doing, we're saying you've got to be in a smaller space. We're putting major effort into, into unsheltered people trying to contain their footprint. Um, so, so that's working on that side of the continuum. Um, you know, so it, there could be work in that area. But moving on to do we do sanctioned encampments, I think we have to understand the cost of doing that and, and the benefit, because I think there would be a lot of expected services uh, like we do in bridge housing and emergency housing as well. Maybe not, but in all likelihood, there would be calls for that. We have to figure out how does that fit into this model. So it is it is probably worth a, a framing and assessment to kind of see what these different choices might look like, what it may take to do it. Uh, in the meantime, though, you saw the Beautify SJ roadmap. It is a very large body of work that I, I don't think is fully resourced. And to take on that effort, we would have to find those resources. So um, it's, it's worth a high level evaluation, at least initially, um, but there are many priorities and many considerations in that. So that's, that's my probably a little bit of uh, all over the map thoughts on it, but uh, maybe the city manager and Jackie have some, some more coherent thought on it. <laughs> that's Actually, Jim, I think you, you articulated it pretty well. And certainly council member, yeah, just acknowledging all the points you made, we, we certainly have progressed uh, very far toward sanction encampments by just our, our practices that we've described today. Um, and you identified, you know, the kind of the, the one issue that, that I think, and Jim's pointing out, is probably the most challenging issue is, is how we identify the appropriate sites and the willingness of the community to support those sites. Um, and certainly if we evolve the current plan to a point where we identify areas in the city where we're not going to tolerate encampments. And Jim mentioned the right away that we are already doing that. Some, some of the speakers mentioned we should do as other cities have done around the creeks. We, we would kind of, I guess, progress further along that spectrum toward sanction encampments. Um, you know, I think, so I do, I do think that is, um, you know, very open for discussion. I, I guess ultimately where we would need to, to be though is if we were to, you know, through this process, designate areas where encampments are not allowed and then thereby saying, if, if you're not in these areas, you are sanctioned. Um, you know, that's, um, I, I do want to have Jackie or the housing team be able to kind of provide a perspective on kind of what are, what are our true obligations and, and and what type of services truly would we need to provide to that type of, of scenario? Um, so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that. Maybe I see Jackie's turned on and it's skip Jackie's perspective on that. Sure, thank you, both um, Jim and Dave. So I want the council to recall that we did at one point have a city council priority about exploring the whole issue of sanction encampments and the city attorney's office had some challenges with us actually sanctioning any encampments uh, because of legal issues. And so that's what led us down the route of enacting AB 2176 and moving into our uh, bridge housing communities that we've effectively uh, been able to expand through the COVID-19 with the emergency interim housing under Jim's leadership. And so, um, I think we have an opportunity to learn more because of the SOAR program, which provides more enhanced services, which is what traditionally a sanctioned encampment might look like without doing all the additional services. But as Jim already alluded to, anytime the city's involved, there is a increase um, and requirement for us to have safety and case management and then that begins to drive the cost of us providing the services um, or implementing this. Um, and so, you know, we certainly discussed under AB 2176 
to the extent that council members identified sites and cleared the path for the administration, that was an opportunity for us to move more quickly. And that has been challenging as well. And I think finally, as we head towards the rainy season, I think from a safety perspective, we are going to want to move people away from the creeks. So I think this whole conversation that we've just had regarding and the suggestion of you know, creating an area where we don't want people to be um, camping in is a legitimate safety concern as we enter into the winter season is, and that is something we plan on uh, taking up with uh, the Beautify um, SJ team and Jim's team to see what possible next steps we can take. Thank you. Um, and I actually really do like that idea or well, what's seemingly in practice, right? With rather than uh, locating or citing sanctioned areas um, that we sort of look at where we would wanna keep people away from. For instance, the right of way as we're already doing. Um, as Jackie points out right now, you know, uh, in or around the waterways, especially as we get closer to the rainy season, as we saw was an issue um, during the floods several years ago. Um, and I, I agree with Jim. Certainly there's a, a challenge when you want to come forward and try to cite a sanctioned encampment. One, one thought, though, I, I had in that regard was uh, similar to what we're doing now. We, we didn't sanction any of the locations that we are servicing today. Simply people started to encamp there and, and we've gone out to respond with services. My idea would be, we, we, we don't do much further than that. We already know where our unhoused community is taking up camp. What we could do is take all of those areas and then determine which of those areas are the best which of those areas are the easiest to provide services, which of those areas are not, you know, intruding in the right of way or in or around other dangerous conditions, for instance, like the waterways during the wet rainy season. That would be my idea that would potentially cut down a lot of the traditional headache and time and effort in the siting work, where the siting is essentially done for us as it is today. We're just actually proclaiming it as, as, as it is a sanctioned area rather than what we're doing today, which is, is sort of silently proclaiming it as sanctioned. We're just providing services. We haven't told anybody that the areas are sanctioned, although I spend way too much time every week trying to explain to my constituents why we're not abating locations. Um, it would personally for me be a hell of a lot easier to just say these areas are sanctioned <laughs> rather than. I'm sorry, there are some rules keeping us from abating or we can only clean up trash or we can only clean out right of ways. It'd be a, a heck of a lot easier to just say, we, we have allowed these particular areas, uh, you know, to, to remain as encampments. Um, because it, it, again, in essence, that's exactly what we're doing in practice right now. That's what we've done during this pandemic. Um, we just, we have not been, the, the message is not very clear. It's not clear to our community. And, and I know that, that uh, I've had a lot of frustrated community members that just don't fully understand what is, you know, happening, who the proper authorities are, why we can't look at other factors, uh, for, uh, regarding safety versus just right of way and, and, uh, other implications. And, uh, I think, you know, we're, we're spinning a lot of our wheels. And in this case, dealing with some of the, the, the effects or the aftermath, like trash and, and, and blight, and we're doing a heck of a job at it. But I, I personally think it, it could be made slightly easier um, on all of us if, if we did just take that, that, that leap um, to actually just uh, make it what it is, a sanctioned encampment, um, and, 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 then, and, then, and then move beyond that. So other, otherwise, I, I, again, I just want to go back and focus on, on the work that has been done because this is a, a tremendous lift. I think it's, it's unfortunate that we have, um, you know, uh, um, this, this many uh, thousands of VW beetles worth of trash that we can pick up from uh, our community. Um, it, 
that in itself is a depressing statistic just that we have that much trash and then to think of actually just even as housed individuals and as we know it's not just our unhoused community as as was denoted i think down there on the monterey corridor i know a lot of that illegal dumping was done by our housed community members that were using it as a a, a dump site essentially and and driving to it and dumping things off and so this is certainly not just a, a an issue or a challenge with our unhoused community and that is is uh, well, I don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I'll just say that it's extremely disheartening that we even, uh, as a community, as a society, that we will compile this much trash and not necessarily even just, you know, it's embarrassing the, the amount of trash we compile in our own homes, regular trash, and goes to our dump. But the amount of trash that we will litter our community with is embarrassing. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I, I, I would hope that we wouldn't even have to put this much effort into this, this challenge, but it's, it's the case that we do. And I know our community members are, are grateful for it. That, that's really well. And my comments, I know I, I already had a conversation with Dave Sykes about this, but I did get one request from a community member. And, and first off, the dashboard is amazing. Um, uh, I will be sharing that with my community members, but there was a request for how could we incorporate uh, the community perspective. And the mayor mentioned this in regards to, you know, our community members are out there, you know, and they can provide us feedback on what they're seeing. And it is just perception. I'm not, you know, the reality of the facts are what you are presenting. The reality of the facts are what's in your dashboard. But I think it would be worthwhile for us to also have an indication from our community members on what their perception is on how well this investment or these investments have paid off. Right. And, and, and to get that feedback from them. And I, I'm just curious if, you know, over time, if that's something that we think we can incorporate, you know, some some periodic surveys on on this effort. We, maybe we can include those results of the surveys into that dashboard. Right. To just say, here's the feedback. Right. Our community has given us a you know five out of five or in these areas or, or whatever it may be. Right. I, I, I would I would love to see that. It was a, a suggestion from a community member. Um, and I thought it was a good one. Um, and that's where I'll end my comment. Thank you. I, I think that ultimately does need to be part of a, of a final kind of outcome-based system. So I think that that's a necessary piece and that's where we think we ultimately need to go. Building the foundation and then adding in those, those necessary complementary elements. Uh, thank you, Council Member Perales. Is there anything more? Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, and I know we, we started to talk briefly, uh, I think in the last council meeting about, you know, what parts of this could really be made public. And I know that's that's gonna take some more work. So I appreciate everyone's uh, attention to the, getting to that point. Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, just a, a few brief comments. I really appreciate the presentation and pre, uh, appreciate the work that you're doing out in the community, Jim and your team, Olympia, everyone else, like in your last slide where you listed all the names of the staff members involved, it truly is too many, but they to acknowledge publicly, but they are so invaluable and responsive to our staff. Each of our staff spend so much time addressing trash, illegal dumpings, abandoned vehicles, which we really didn't talk about much today, but all the things that are creating blight in their community. And we're, I think we're just noticing it more because we're home more and we're um, not out working and distracted as we have been in the past, but also trash is, is getting wor worse. A couple of things though, I, I, I am so grateful for the presentation and I am so grateful for the work that you are doing. So thank you for your efforts uh, in a couple of District 9 areas, particularly Donna Lane. I know that uh, Gail called earlier and was frustrated about Donna Lane, but uh, I know that the resident, uh, the unhoused resident eventually took services and is, uh, uh, I, I assume, living somewhere with uh, social services and mental health services. But Olympia, I want to thank you publicly for all of your efforts there. It was one person like uh, was shown in a couple of other slides about how much uh, unhoused can collect and how it is not, uh, while we may consider it trash, it really isn't. It's things that they can generate income from. And so they're 
have their little business where they're selling things and, and making money, but you, uh, it really cleaned up that community and other areas that the neighbors uh, are very happy and, and relieved. Um, so I truly appreciate you for all your efforts there and for the, uh, I, I'm really uh, pleased to see all the interagency work that is going on and the efforts in coordinating there. That's really important. It's not just the city that has jurisdiction and, and the fact now that we're in discussions and have MOUs and others with various agencies is also really important because when the community calls us, the residents call us, they don't want to hear us say, well, this is Caltrans or this is, you know, someone else, this is Valley Waters District. They just want to know we're taking care of it. So with an interagency agreement, that would that will really help and hopefully work out those situations. And we're already seeing it along our creek beds and we're seeing it in our right of ways and our, our uh, paths and that's that's really great. I have a, just a couple questions. Uh, mostly I'm just really excited to see Beautify SJ and have this study session. I am concerned about resources and uh, how many, I know we, we authorized 3 million. To me, that seems like a drop in the bucket right now, given the level of effort and the scoping that you have. How long will the three, how far will the 3 million carry you? And uh, I suppose in the budget session next year, we'll see um, increases or additional resources needed, both staffing and funding for our, um, the outsourcing that we do. Jim, can you address that or any thoughts about that? Yeah, so appreciate the question, council member. So in terms of the, the allocated resources for the program this year, in July, we got the $4 million allocation from the Coronavirus Relief Fund. And then the council augmented that with $3 million in the September, October timeframe. And then we awarded agreements um, and, and have those out working now. Uh, we will not spend all of the, the four and 3 million by December. So we will be using that into the new calendar year. Um, and our goal is to carry on service model 1.0 to the end of this fiscal year to June. Uh, that 7 million will be spread across more than just the first six months. Uh, the city uh, manager and budget office will be bringing a recommendation to the council next Tuesday on rebalancing the coronavirus relief fund and the contingency operations reserve. And so there will be a, uh, likely an additional recommended allocation within that for this program to carry us to the end of the year. Uh, but it's not at that same level. We believe we're building up to a higher service level. So our rate of expenditure uh, is, is ramping up to, to get to that kind of optimal service model 1.0 service level. Um, you know, so so that, that's conceptually kind of what we're doing. If, if I, and, and this, don't hold me to it, um, but we're estimating maybe it's maybe it's about from a total need maybe a half a million dollars a month maybe a six million dollar allocation a year of ongoing but we do already have some ongoing resources the um, encampment abatement funds that housing used to do abatements with that money has moved into the beautify sj program and is being used for cleaning purposes um, the housing department also through the soar program has resources for uh, ad additional outreach and cleaning. So we're able to, at, at the source site, 16 key sites to have funding for trash and cleanup activities. So we are going to assemble all of the existing ongoing resources, assess with the one time that we've gotten and put together a, probably a, a tiered or a, a set of alternatives of what different ongoing investment uh, recommendations will produce in terms of service levels. So probably developing something like that for the 21-22 budget year. So the council can see, you know, what we already have allocated, what might be new needed to fill a gap, and what gap do we want to fill to what service level. And that would be part of a 21-22 budget process. So we intend to carry service model 1.0 through the end of June 
refine it, understand the costs, and develop the best, most equitable, effective, efficient program we can for Service Model 2.0 and make those recommendations in the budget process in the spring. Great. That, thank you. So it sounds like you have the funds figured out for now and uh, that through the, the uh, coronavirus funds and other funds, you're able to do your, the work that you need and that you've laid out under 1.0. So that, that's great. I, I, how do we, um, you know, I'm thinking about the, our unhoused residents and how we are approaching them to contain their trash, to clean up their trash. How do we, do we have a team who approaches them first? I mean, I, I know we, we don't just go out there and clean up around them, but how, can you kind of walk me through the process of how we try to work with them? And I understand, you know, this is a very sensitive issue. We wanna treat them with humanity and respect. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly they wanna clean up around themselves too, but maybe they don't have the tools. So. How do we, can you just walk me through? Yeah, that, that, that's happened? a very important um, process to understand. Let me have Neil and Olympia and then maybe Reagan as well, because there's a close collaboration between housing and shelter outreach and those types of services to get the people the help they need to get out of the situation. But then Neil and Olympia and the Beautify SJ team are also trying to organize within the encampment for them to contain and, and, and have a cleaner environment that we're, they're working. So Neil, yeah. let's just start and then we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jim, and thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, like Jim mentioned, it's it's definitely a, a an approach that uh, utilizes a lot of different uh, partners. You know, uh, Reagan and the outreach team from housing is a, a huge component on this. Uh, but what we have found is that we have staff uh, that are helping manage out at these different tier levels. And especially at the tier three, which is the most complicated, not only from size, but be, uh, due to behavioral uh, issues, right, as well, that will be present at the camp. And so we know that our staff have to be out there prior to any major cleanup. You know, our goal is to have a consistent level of staff that knows these encampment residents, you know, recognizes them by face, knows their names, uh, knows their history, you know, and their story. Uh, one thing that benefited us in this effort, uh, where a number of our staff uh, who are leads in the Beautify uh, team right now, had their origins in our department in uh, youth intervention, uh, gang intervention work, utilizing the same skill sets of, you know, being individually focused, right? Knowing that change does not come fast, right? Uh, talking to people, knowing their stories, that's why we want to continue focusing on this level of model. I mean, like uh, one thing that I really liked about working uh, inside this branch over the last, last few months was really melding the philosophies, um, you know, with housing department and our work uh, and focusing us on a humanistic uh, uh, viewpoint on this. That's so important. Yeah. And, and so that's, I think that's the approach of our team. They come out there uh, prior uh, to any major cleanup, they talk to them, they work alongside with the outreach. Um, and the other effort I'd say is a level of consistency, the same faces coming out uh, and talking to the uh, residents. I know Reagan, uh, in terms of the outreach, has some statistics on how many times it takes to approach uh, some homeless in terms of getting them receptive to services as well. So I'll turn it over to Reagan. Thanks, Neil. This is uh, Reagan with the housing department. I would. Um... You know, just add, we really work um, and coordination daily with Olympia and Neil and the Beautify teams. And we do try and um, pick the best team who, who has good relationships in this encampment. encampment. Is it PATH? Is it Home First? Or, you know, is it actually a Beautify San Jose team? And so we do... Um, think through each location that we go to and what's the best um, approach and who has good relationships. The trash bags, the green beautify trash bags are um, distributed by our past teams and our home first teams. And so 
uh, they, um, they have seen our EOC protocol and they understand that protocol and are able to help uh, message that protocol as well. And I would, I would just add, I guess, to Neil's point about, you know, outreach, they really are um, about building that relationship and that trust. Uh, what we know about every person who is homeless is that um, they've experienced some form of trauma and, and um, really having that person centered approach in working with them is critical and really outreach their primary responsibility is to build that trust and that relationship. Um, and it starts with sometimes just the little things. What do you need today? Um, do you need some water? Do you need a hygiene kit? I have some socks. Um, what can I help you with today? And it's repeatedly doing those um, trust building and what, how can I help you today? And then, um, and then we talk about housing and kind of how can we help with that? And there's some statistics out of this, out of the city of New York that says it takes about six months of repeated outreach before a person is willing um, to go into shelter or housing. And sometimes it's a lot less, um, but that's uh, the, the most recent number that I've seen. And let me just add in one additional point. So, you know, it, you know, not all the cases are, are the same at all. And, and in some cases we have real challenges where they don't want to uh, contain their trash, have some organization. We've all seen those situations. We did issue uh, an additional protocol in October, an enhanced cleanup protocol as well that you know, if, we're, if we aren't getting any cooperation and, and there's potentially a variety of reasons, it could be behavioral health, mental health. Uh, it could be people just don't, don't wanna kinda get on board with stuff that we need to have the neighborhood be acceptable for all residents. And we do have protocols that we can uh, post that we are gonna do an enhanced cleanup and you do need to do more containment. So I think Neil and Reagan described our uh, efforts to, to encourage, support, assist. And we also have tools that require and expect and require as well. So we are trying to approach it from a number of different points on the continuum. And I think we're going to need to continue to do that. And I feel like we're broadening the, the, the ways in which we can more effectively work with people in encampments and have neighbors that are around them feel like we're also not forgetting about them in the process. Right. That, that, that's the tricky, the tricky balance between all of this is letting the neighbors, the house neighbors know that we're, we're aware we're working with the unhoused residents, but it's not uh, an easy or quick solution. So I, I appreciate that answer to my question that helps me understand it. And I'm also sensitive to the time, but I just have a couple other questions. And actually I wanna piggyback on what council member Perala said regarding in, encampment, uh, sanctioned encampments and, and focusing on where encampments shouldn't be along our creek beds and right of ways and, and enforcing that versus where they should be in a creating a sanctioned encampment. I, I kind of like that approach and maybe we can uh, dig deeper into that at a later date. I have one small question about the MasterCard and uh, then I think I'm finished. I'll listen to the rest of my colleagues and one, uh, the question about the MasterCard and the trash for cash, uh, it, does it operate like a strict debit card where there are no fees accrued uh, to the, okay, that's what I wanna hear. Cause it's a credit card. If it's a credit card, it may be 20 bucks but it ends up being 10 when they use them. Good to know. Thank you, Olympia. I appreciate that. With that, I will, uh, I've, I conclude my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I might just also add an, a nice feature is we're actually able to constrain the expenditures too. I believe, for example, it's coded so it can't be used at liquor stores, for example. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting tool. 
um, hopefully it will help more folks get on their feet. That's great to know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks to our team for doing all the great work on that, uh, Olympia and everybody. Uh, okay, uh, Ken Swinner, Camus. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have um, I really appreciate the, t the 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 fine work that the entire staff has put together here. Um, um, I, I, first, you know, I think that some reference was made that uh, this is a you know countrywide problem. I've I've read numerous articles where it says the problem in California is growing, but in other parts of the country, it's actually decreasing. Um, you know, I don't know if the, I mean. I actually read that in multiple sources. Do you guys have an idea of why you think this problem is increasing in in California and like Oregon and Washington and some of the West Coast uh, cities? Is it just because of our weather or our our our, um, our you know I'm talking about homelessness, obviously. Uh, would do you think it's just our weather or or do you think um, other states are actively uh, sending people our way? Um, I'm I, like I said, I'm 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 puzzled. I'll let I'll let Jackie take that one. I, I I'll be honest, Councilor. I, I don't have a nationwide perspective on trends in homelessness. Yeah, I will start, but I'll I'll have Reagan finish it off. So I think part of it has to do with weather. People come to where it's more, uh, it is warmer. It also has to do with our cost of living and the continued income inequality that exists, where we have. Um, a growth in incomes in the higher ranges and a stagnant income growth in the lower wages um, and a very high cost of living in this area. And those conditions create um, what you see on our streets. And I will turn it over to see if Reagan has anything else to add. Uh, I think that that's certainly the, the primary reasons we've, we just continue to see the cost of living increase and uh, wages not being kept up. And we see that, you know, up and down the West Coast. Um, I think that the, there are challenges along the East Coast as well. Um, from recent conversations I've had with folks in uh, cities like Philadelphia and New York are continuing to see um, challenges as well. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I, I saw a map and there's like a the upper right hand corner of the United States and all the West Coast um, is going up and the rest of the country is actually going down in homelessness. And so I, I don't know if anybody's looking at that. Is anybody looking at what the, the county is doing to address some of these? Um, and I, I noticed that this is all work that our city has been doing. And I know that our city is, you know, carrying a lot on its shoulders here is, is any of um staff uh you know you, you guys didn't really mention a whole lot of integration with with what the county is doing and uh any efforts on their part uh is anybody analyzing that in in terms of on the um unsheltered and homeless support front clearly we have the community plan to end homelessness that the council um endorsed in august Reagan leading our homeless support and services branch of the EOC ha is running a, a joint uh, homeless response task force with the county uh, and meets with them regularly. I was a, a pretty regular participant in that as well, developing strategies around uh, emergency sheltering, uh, our emergency interim housing, um, how we're working with encampments. So there's a, an incredible amount of work and then Reagan has launched our multidisciplinary uh, assessment intervention team. And we're doing a pilot in five locations in the city and county behavioral health and, and substance abuse is part of that team. I'll be honest, we, we need them to do more. We need them to step up more on that front uh, because these really challenging encampments that were in the pilot program um, have unsheltered residents in them that have challenges that require expert, consistent county public health services. And uh, so we need them more on that front. But uh, that's my limited perspective on that and experience on that. Reagan, anything you would add or, or correct? 
it's all uh, correct, Jim. I, I would add our, our work on the community plan. We have an uh, implementation team that does um, include a deputy county executive, Keeley, as um, on that work group. It's myself, Keeley, Jennifer Loving, uh, and the county, Catherine Kaminsky. Uh, so we are coordinating regularly on implementation of the community plan. The county and Keeley is really focused on our integrating our work with the county safety net systems, behavioral health, county reentry, all of those systems where we need to just have better coordination and integration of our, of our services. Yeah, well, you know, that's what I was, that's what I was getting to. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, this is a great effort to address the, the symptoms of, of these problems, but I was wondering how much effort is being made uh, by our county to address the causes. And quite frankly, um, I hear you loud and clear that more needs to be done by the county. Um, and I would love to get advice either you don't have to give it to me today about what actual things can be done to address um, mental health and drug addiction uh, for these folks. Often from, from what staff tells me privately, it's tough to get these folks out of the encampments because they are, um, you know, set in their ways on, on some of the drug issues. Um, and I'd love to hear what can be done uh, to address people who are, you know, on drugs and want to stay on drugs and are saying no to help. Actually, the reality is more people are ready to get help and we just don't have the services for them. And so I really think that's the first step is we need to have increased services for the people who are ready to um, accept the help but can't get into a rehab program or can't get the mental health services they need. Okay. Council Let's... member, we're, we're um, currently working with behavioral health on a, an analysis, a, a service and gaps analysis of, of um, what services are currently offered and where are the gaps, particularly for our homeless population, um, because just having a better understanding of what the need is versus what's available is so uh, critically important. And that gaps analysis study is, is called out in our community plan to end homelessness. And I was just on a call with behavioral health yesterday talking about that analysis. Um, they'll, there, we have a, a representative from County Behavioral Health on our strategy three implementation working group so that we can stay closely aligned with um, with that work that behavioral health is is doing. That's that's great to hear. This is the kind of thing that I think is absolutely necessary. I'm, I'm, I will I will add one more thing. We also are uh, working with County Behavioral Health on a pilot program uh, for the SOAR program that will that we're starting. What we really are asking. Uh, behavioral health to do is to have a um, a pilot coordination or um, handoff program so that when our SOAR outreach teams are in our large encampments, we actually have um, a back door, if you will, uh, to behavioral health services. Uh, we're going to pilot a, a different way, I think, of um, of access and, and partnership just for our SOAR program. And we'll see how that goes uh, while we're doing this sort of larger behavioral health uh, service and gaps analysis. Well, good. I, I wish you all the luck. Obviously, this is not, you know, I, my, my days are numbered here, but I, I intend to keep up with this issue because I'm passionate about it. I think that we need we need to make sure that we have the services available. And if and if it is more mental health and, and drug addiction services, an evaluation is absolutely necessary of how many you know, facilities that we have and how many more we need. I think it's, uh, you know, your work, that work is invaluable. I think prevention is, is actually 
uh, money better spent on, 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 on getting people off the streets and into, into the help that they need. Um, and especially if they are from other areas, your reunification <clears throat> needs to be a priority as well. Um, because I, I, I could tell you, you guys did a, a great job. Uh, I, I, it took a long time, but uh, the uh, encampment off of uh, Amadan Expressway and, and Highway 85, you cleaned it up and you removed 14 people that were encamped, but you, you, couldn't, you couldn't remove two from, I understand, from your emails uh, because they refused services and they refused to leave. Um, so, you know, those are the things that, that we ne need to understand. Why did those two you know, want to stay? Is it because they're, you know, they, they, they prefer this kind of lifestyle or is it um, mental health or drug addiction uh, uh, issues that, that they refuse to deal with? Uh, Councilman Camus, was that a question? Well, it, it, you know, uh, well, I, I, I would love to know specifically in that case uh, where yeah. staff worked so hard over a couple of, of, of uh, months to remove uh, some of the blighted area with so much dumping, um, you know, and, and I guess if you want to tell me offline, that's fine with me, uh, but I would appreciate knowing why we couldn't help those two. Uh, we helped 14. Well, thank you for that. And, and I, I really appreciate the work. I, I don't want to seem ungrateful, but I want to know how to diagnose the entire problem and not, and, and, and again, the majority is fantastic. And I don't want to say that, I, you know, this is not good. It's great. Uh, but, um, you know, what I, I think what we can do, council member, is unless Olympia Reagan have a very brief answer to it, why don't we follow up offline and, and give it the, the attention it deserves? Great. Okay. Th thank you all for all your hard work um, and uh, your focus on this. It's well needed. It's, it's what the community, um, I, what I get most of the calls about. Thank you. Thank you. And Jim, I appreciate that suggestion. Uh, you know, if we think trash is hard, addiction will take us about 10 study sessions. So uh, these are not, not simple problems because they're human problems. Um, Councilman Esparza? Thank you, Mayor. Perfect segue. These are not simple problems for sure. Um, and uh, I, I just I wanted to correct something out there. Um, the uh, United uh, States Interagency Council on Homelessness uh, posts a lot of research and information on their website, including a state by state point in time census count on homelessness. And there's actually no state in our country that has seen a decrease in homelessness. So uh, unfortunately, um, and so I just wanted to point that out and that um, definitely uh, there, this is a, a bigger issue in the in Texas and the West Coast and the East Coast. If you look at those stats, um, we are not alone, um, unfortunately, and we're not alone in trying to uh, figure out and address the symptoms of some of the underlying issues that are facing us. Um, and I wanted to, first off, um, add my thanks to the team working on this. Um, you know, I think probably all of us um, on the council get uh, calls about blight and um, encampments. Uh, I, I uh, probably get some of the most, um, and this is uh, something my office hears a lot about. And so I'm very much aware of how much work has gone into this. Um, thank you, Jim, and the whole team, Sarah, for for creating a whole database and mapping system in just a few short months mm -hmm. um, is enormous. Uh, Olympia's team um, does an incredible job on the ground. Um, and I know because we're out there um, and we see it um, and it's huge. And so, and thank you, Neil and Rick and all the, the slide of folks um, who have been working so diligently and really focused on this um, during uh, a global pandemic. And um, before I get to my questions, I just wanted to point this out for the public, for anybody that might be listening, is that, um, you know, the team that has led this work um, is, for many cases, 
being taken off other duties to do this work. So there are folks from different departments with a variety of responsibilities that shows how much bandwidth this is taking in our city, um, not just from a budget perspective, which we will get to address as a council um, mid-year, and I'm assuming uh, in a few months after that, um, that this is, um, because we hear so much from our residents and this is such a huge issue, we are responding to it, but that has consequences. Um, so I just wanted to remind folks of that. Um, and um, I also wanted to bring up the county. I think um, the county, what many people don't realize is the county largely funds the homeless system. Um, and I know that I have the county's largest homeless shelter in my district. I have the county's largest permanent supportive housing um, development in my district and a lot of other projects in my district. And those are county funded contracts and the county, um, operates our um, HMIS and a lot of other things. And so they are certainly um, not just doing their part, they're actually carrying the bulk of that system. However, I think as we move forward, we um, are jointly realizing how critical other departments are to this process, particularly in mental and behavioral health. Um, and I would also argue health services as a whole um, are really critical um, and, and that it's behavioral health in particular is a path to shelter. There are a lot of folks who are, you know, if we're able to get them uh, through all our extensive outreach, um, if we're able to, to get them in that right moment where they're willing to accept help, and there isn't a bed or a placement on the other side of that, that's a huge, huge issue. And so I just um, wanted to um, offer any additional help I could offer in um, creating a stronger partnership with behavioral health and mental health. And I know that um, the County Reentry Committee and the County Homelessness Task Force um, that Councilmember Prowlis and I served on um, had a lot of discussion about that and the county did commit to do it. Um, I just want to emphasize that we need, um, we need that process. We need, um, we need beds, right? We need a model to be developed from beginning, from when someone is willing to accept help in the creek, that they get it and then they can go on to each step from there and ultimately get a shelter and then really ultimately get housed, which is what we all want, right? Um, I think that's hugely, hugely critical. Um, uh, the other thing, I, I did wanna just address sanction encampments. Um, uh, again, if there are a lot of challenges to that outlined um, in years and years of research, um, on sanction encampments. Um, I would encourage folks to, to look at some of that research or again, go on to the US Interagency Council on Homelessness, which has some white papers and some information on it. Um, it also, uh, but I just, I just wanted to bring that up. I think that question was addressed, uh, was answered um, pretty well. Um, and similar to that, Oakland has been brought up um, and I think in the context that we are all trying to figure this out, I think Oakland is taking another path to try and figure it out. Um, I actually pulled all the memos um, on that when that came to Oakland um, and, uh, and you know, watched the results and the vote and the conversations around that. Um, I think what folks don't realize is that it would in effect sanction and encampments outside of that zone. So what that would mean is, is encampments that would be across the street from homes would be quote, quote, sanctioned, right? And I don't know how many of us and how many neighborhoods in the city are willing to, um, to live with that circumstance. Um, and I suspect not many. So I think, you know, um, we can continue our path um, and, uh, and watch and learn from other cities um, as I think we're all watching and learning from each other right now. Um, 
I wanted to um, to bring up um, abatements. Um, I uh, I don't think it should be a first option, but it should be an option, particularly when public safety is an issue. And I've said this before, and I will say it again. Um, when we had people running out into Story Road at Story and 101 um, and fires going on by the in that encampment, you know, cars and flames and things like that. That's a public safety issue. Um, when we have huge fires right next to mobile home parks, that is where you have two minutes to get out of a mobile home. Um, that's a public safety concern. I have had a number of fires very close to some mobile home parks in my district. And yeah, it's concerning. Um, also, there have been um, a number of fires um, next to uh, some schools by the creek. Um, and again, those create public safety concerns. And so I um, appreciate the uh, process um, and the, um, the thought and the logic that goes into that. And I just, uh, it has gone into our work, but I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that there are public safety um, issues that are not um, everywhere and they're not all the time, but they do exist. And I think that we need to be mindful of that because um, I see it in my district and I don't want to, um, I don't want to face a future where um, people lose their homes or their lives um, because of some of these issues. Um, and I wanted to also thank the team for focusing um, on equity. I think, um, I think it's incredibly important to ensure that not just the loudest or the most connect, politically connected get heard, but that we take a sort of empirical um, data-based approach um, that, uh, that looks at where the greatest need is. And I wanted to thank the team for that. I think um, I appreciate the, um, the humanistic approach and wanted to remind folks that humanistic also includes the neighborhoods, particularly overcrowded, very low income, underserved neighborhoods who are right now hit hardest by COVID. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's 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 a balance. It's a tough one, but I have neighborhoods dealing with public safety and and sanitation issues, and um, they're overcrowded. They're um, getting sicker um, from COVID more than most. They're dying from COVID more than most, and and this is we can't lose sight of that. Um, and so I wanted to thank the team for making sure that equity is included in our approach, um, and. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, and so I'm gonna shift a little bit to illegal dumping. Um, so uh, I think it's been mentioned before, this is not all homelessness. Um, <clears throat> this includes a lot of illegal dumping. I have some spots along the creek um, where people just come in and dump trucks loads of uh, you know, unwanted items. Uh, Monterey, where we picked up what, um, is it 800,000 or a million pounds of trash uh, before COVID um, is uh, about 80% of that is illegal dumping. Um, and so, you know, what are we, what are our long-term plans or what are our plans to um, add some enforcement to that? Yeah. Council member, um, as I laid out the roadmap, the roadmap for 2021, we have a couple of things around illegal dumping to uh, dig into much further. The first one is a, is a program assessment of illegal dumping. Uh, it's, it's been a program that's up and running. It certainly has a lot of production associated with it, but we wanna make sure that it, it's operating in an optimal way and we integrate it with all the other aspects of Beautify San Jose. So that's one aspect, it's on our roadmap, it's a priority to do. We also recognize the need for an enforcement program, a communication, education, and enforcement. So I did have a meeting with the primary enforcement departments in our city, code enforcement, 
environmental enforcement and the police department. And, and the reality is with their missions and kind of the service targets that they're focused on, they don't have a lot of bandwidth or resources to do illegal dumping enforcement. From my perspective, I think we need to look at kind of what their priorities are and how they rate and rank against uh, the issue of lots of illegal dumping happening in our city to see should any reprioritization occur. Uh, and if there literally is no opportunity for, for reprioritizing illegal dumping enforcement because what they're doing rates higher, then I think we have to look at other resources. Um, it is not an easy thing to do illegal dumping enforcement. You literally have to catch people in the act or uh, some similar types of very concrete evidence. Um, it's a little bit, you know, I, I haven't been closely involved in the fireworks enforcement issue. And I certainly don't wanna open that can of worms up in this conversation, but I suspect we would have many of the similar types of, of issues interwoven on an illegal dumping enforcement, but it, it is on our roadmap, but it will take some marshalling of effort to scope it, figure it out, what it's gonna take, what are the right strategies? Do we have any resources to redeploy or do we need any new ones to, to implement those strategies that would be effective? So it's clearly an important piece, but it's not just something that we can snap our fingers and have happen unless we're willing to let go of other things that those enforcement agencies in our city are doing. Thank you. And I know this, this has come up before, particularly when we've looked at cameras. Um, has anybody found an alternative to the $30,000 cameras for illegal dumping or is, has that, was that put on hold with COVID? Yeah, not not to my knowledge. I don't know that we have have. Maybe I'll ask uh, Rick or Olympia. Do you have any additional information about further uh, less costly camera enforcement tools or anything like that, Rick or Olympia? Yeah, I think it's it's something we'll be investigating in the new year. Um, but you're right, Jim. At this time, there there's no updates on that front. If I could just add to that, though, we did recently, we just found out, received a grant from the Mattress Council in the state of California that will purchase two additional cameras and license plate readers. So we've been, we'll increase our camera kind of how many we have across the city, but it's through a grant. It will buy the same type of camera and that camera is $30,000. What we've done is reached out to our partners in other cities across um, California. And this seems to be the best type of camera because it collects both license plates and the visual camera piece. Um, other cities are also looking for something that's more affordable, but they haven't found anything that will really provide the type of information we need to cite someone. Okay, that's helpful to know because I, I um, you know, I do understand that the enforcing it requires, right, a level of proof. Um, so, okay, that's helpful. Um, I, I I just think we really need to have some enforcement. You know, we don't have a lot of teeth and people know that. And so the dumping is um, really gotten out of control in some spots. And so it costs us money to clean it up. Um, and I, I, think, I think of it similar actually to the street racing ordinance where we want it as a deterrent, right? Um, and, and that that gets spread through word of mouth and that it does take some enforcement, but frankly, we just don't want people to do it in the first place. Um, that's helpful, thank you. Um, and I have a, a question um, about the um, interagency coordination. That is super exciting. Um, I. It sounds nerdy to say, but it is. It's very exciting and really important. Um, so uh, it's so needed um, to do all that. And so that was really great to see the slide with the different agencies and where we're at with them. Um, I had a question, uh, two questions. So one, um, are some of the agreements that we've done in the past or that we've looked at require us to do the work and then get reimbursed. Is that the model that we're continuing to look at? 
in the future or, um, or will other agencies be doing cleanup as well? Yeah, I, I initially I think where we're at is having the other agencies do a better job of cleaning up their property. You know, I, I don't think they're they're anxious to start sending money to the city. Okay. Uh, they are probably struggling from a, a resource uh, and and gap issue like we are. But I, I think the first step is figuring out what it's going to take to get their properties clean too. You got to start with a foundation because I don't know what they'd send us. I'm certainly not willing to obligate the city to have those properties be clean and then probably come up with a dollar amount that they would ship our way that would be so insufficient to really get the job done that it wouldn't make sense. So you really have to understand what properties they have, what conditions they're in, what's it going to take to do it, can they do it effectively? They, they need to do the same thing, right location, right service, right frequency. And with Caltrans, we're, we're going through that model with them. We, we are, and, and I think they're, they're very interested in understanding here about it. I don't think any of the other agencies are taking nearly as systematic approach to it as, as we are. Um, Valley Water is, is pretty uh, focused but it's more where their properties, you know, and, and there are so many intermingling properties on the creek. Mm -hmm. You know, we own this one, private property here, them, that, that it's not always easy to get a clean, long stretch of a creek uh, fully clean. But try, trying to bring my answer in, Councilmember, I think we're going to do the foundational work of figuring out what does it take to get those properties clean and then what's the best, most efficient way. If it is us doing it, we would be open to that. It has to be sufficient, um, but those are things that we're working on very hard. As you can imagine, it's it's labor intensive work, working with other agencies to get to this. Um, it, there's a level of complexity compared to us just figuring out on our properties, but to work with them to figure it out on theirs. Um, in the meantime though, we are doing more cleanup work with them. We're partnering with each agency more than we ever were, and we'll continue to do that while we try to build a better service model around other agencies, and that could include reimbursement if that ends up being the most effective and efficient way to do it. Thank you. That's refreshing to hear. I um, am not interested in the city getting lowballed either. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we've put so much, or you've put so much time uh, and effort and expertise into creating a system um, that will continue to develop, but um, I suspect not all of the entities that we work with have developed such a, um, you know, expansive system. Um, so hope, hopefully um, we are, can help them get to that point as well, because I suspect they're in different places. Um, I had another question about the interagency agreements. Uh, so with Union Pacific, um, so communication and response times have, have been slow. Um, how will, what commitments are being made around that moving forward? I'll let Olympia, who's led the negotiations with Neil and from the city attorney's office. And, and I did hear we got an executed agreement back from, from Union Pacific just, I think yesterday. Um, Olympia, Talk a little bit about response times and then the, the kind of the proactive multiple cleaning efforts throughout the year as well, very briefly, if you would. Definitely. Council members, so what we've agreed to is eight coordinated cleanups to do our proactive work. What we usually do is gather a list of things that we consider low priority issues that need to be addressed during those eight cleanups. Union Pacific will um, address issues that are a safety concern. If we email them or something is reported directly to them that they deem is a safety concern, they will come out and address those specific items immediately. Immediately, what does that mean? Like they have, have they committed to a window like 24 hours, 48 hours, something like that? The window. So I'll give you an example. If someone tells me there's been a fire on their property and it's supposed to have photos, if we get those over to them or the reporting party does, and they determine that that's really close to the rail line, they'll send someone out immediately. They determine that it's 20 feet from where the rail line is. They may wait a couple days. 
or a week or maybe even two weeks before they address that. So when they look at safety, it's what could impact their ability for a train to safely um, travel along the rail line. Okay, that's actually, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a step forward. It's a big step forward, actually. Um, and so we've had some issues like with the gate, as you know, that was um, smashed and, and, uh, and it, it was many, many men, months before they responded. Um, they finally did, which is great, but um, the safety issues are huge. And so I'm glad to hear that they're responding to those and I'll, we'll continue to ask um, residents and businesses to send photos. Um, cause I do think that's really powerful. Um, and, uh, okay. Can, that's can, can, Councilor Sparsa, can I just yes. do a quick time check with staff? Sure. Cause I we're now have, 10 minutes before noon and we have several other folks. Sure. Um, I just have staff, one can, question. Can I, can I just ask the city manager, um, how, how much longer do we have folks for? <laughs> yeah. Um, um I have to do a bit of a check myself. I, I know some of us have a actually a hard stop at noon um, for other meetings. Um, so, uh, Jim, what's I'm certainly available. I'm certainly available to to go uh, as long as the council needs. Yeah. So I think we'll be okay. able to have some stay on, Mayor, uh, myself, okay. and some others. I, I might have to go to the restroom, but <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm with we you. Why don't you do that, Jim? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excuse my, uh, but uh, just health first. Um, okay, uh, Councilor Sparta. Thank you. Um, so I had another question about funding. So um, the the blight was an allowable expense um, for the the COVID funding, um, and we added. Uh, we're going to add our own money. I guess this is a question for Dave Sykes or Lee. I don't know if Lee. Is, I thought I saw Lee, but I might be wrong. Okay, um, so uh, Dave, you might not have the answer to this, but um, as the next stimulus bills come about, um, do we expect to, in the short term, I realize that these are long-term expenses and we need to put our own money into it, but in the short term, in the next bill, are we also, once we have that information, do we plan to analyze it so that we can use some of that funding for blight and sanitation? Yeah, Councilor, I, I would expect so, you know, assuming that that funding uh, offers the, the flexibility that we're looking for in terms of being able to address the impacts that COVID is presenting to, to all aspects of our community. So yeah, I would expect so. Okay, thank you. Um, and just lastly, I'll, I'll end with the comment um, that as going back to homelessness, as homelessness has increased um, in our city, in our county, in our state, um, we need to continue to look at preventing it, which means displacement policies, tenant protections, extremely low income housing um, and eviction protections. And, um, you know, there, there are policies that we are in control of as a city council to prevent um, or slow down increases in homelessness. And that should be on the table. Thank you. Thank you, council member Krasko. I thank you so much. I, I want to thank the team for all of the work that you've been doing. This is not an easy, uh, uh, you know, this is a very complex issue and we have a large city and from the maps that you showed, uh, you know, it's a, a widespread uh, issue. And of course it's most definitely in, in, in my district and uh, our residents are, are not happy with uh, the condition of our, of our district and, and everything that we're seeing. Uh, just a couple of things that I'm concerned about, you know, um, I think it was Sada that mentioned in her presentation, which struck me as a very interesting comment. And Sada, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to correct me if it wasn't your presentation, but, but someone said with increased resources, there was increased services. Was that your presentation? Hi, council member. Yeah, we were referring to tier three and the scaled resources specifically for that service. It, and, uh, and I mean, it, it just, 
you know, I, I don't know if, if, uh, if I missed something there, but I mean, it, it, it's just, it just seemed like a very logical statement, increased, increased source resources led to increased services, which led to increased, what was it? Increased uh, number of, uh, of, of tons of garbage that were collected. And I don't know if you have that, that uh, slide, but it just like, seemed like, just like, just a natural order of things, a very natural and obvious statement. What that, that's correct, uh, council member. I was referring to the, the magnitude of change with the increased resources. Would you like me to pull up that? Yes, yeah, you could just pull it up because, and I, and I know it's very obvious and I don't wanna take, and I don't wanna dwell on it very, uh, very long because I know that everybody is on a time crunch. Uh, but I just, I just wanna, I just wanna revisit that one slide And, and I guess the most obvious, uh, I guess the, the, the question that just pops up for me is if we already know this, and, and I know that we're running on limited funds, uh, I guess the question would be, okay, so if we know this and we have an increased uh, demand for services, then it would just seem, you know, that the most obvious solution is increase our services by increasing resources uh, by expanding city team or 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 whatever the 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 lead uh, the lead uh, stakeholders and the lead team members would deem necessary and so my question is I guess to Sara or to Jim is what do we need to do to to increase our resources in this aspect because it's, it's an issue that we can't seem to get a hold of. So uh, to me, if we have limited resources, uh, it's a matter of shifting where it's not working or where, we, where it's not as efficient or as effective in order to get a handle on it. And a couple of things that come to mind is this, before, before you jump in, Jim, because I saw you yeah. taking a breath. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is, uh, one is, I, I think uh, Council Member Sparsa brought something up in terms of enforcement, and, and you made mention that we don't have the bandwidth uh, as of yet to to enforce uh, to to uh, really enforce some of the policies that we have. When when I first came on council six years ago, uh, the mayor and I co-authored uh, a couple of policies to really tighten up and and have a little bit more teeth in terms of how we um, how we uh, uh, I guess. I don't want to say punish, but but uh, we we strengthened the the policy and we we raised the fines on illegal dumping. Now it's I think ten thousand um, dollars at the top of the of the violators, those who are repeated violators. And I don't know if anyone has ever been fined ten thousand dollars, and uh, and I'm sure that has to do with a, a lack of enforcement. But we have. We have at least a million pairs of eyes in the city of San Jose, minus those who are violating the policy. So could we not use those million pairs of eyes to help us with enforcement and do a little bit of, you know, use a carrot and a stick and, and have folks without them jeopardizing their safety um, share the wealth. And so if we were to find people, uh, incentivize and, and use that, those funds to, to incentivize and, and, and share it with the folks that actually report and catch people in the act. So, so Councilor, a couple of questions in there. I'll go back to your first one about, uh, Sarah's kind of preliminary findings and, and insights that, if we invest more in more frequent service, we get cleaner conditions and it seems like a logical thing and, and why we would not do it. Well, in fact, we have done it um, at least in an initial phase. And I, I think that's what you're seeing on this, on this graph here that in phase three in the tan yellow area was prior to, we were using some kind of emergency contracts prior to the council's allocation of additional $3 million in 
early October, our level of production was down. The council did allocate more resources to this for us to do more. We awarded three contracts and we jumped up production and we were seeing cleaner conditions. So I, I think this is a, a initial step, a down payment, a certainly moving in the direction of what needs to be done. So I think your point and Sarah's point illustrate we are going down that path. What we are recommending though, is let us understand how effective and efficient these, we have three different vendors that we awarded contracts to, and we have three different nonprofit service providers that are doing work for us as well. And we're evaluating all of them to see which are most effective, which are most efficient, which get the job done the best. And we'll keep doing that in service model 1.0 through the rest of this fiscal year. And we will have recommendations in the spring to right size the level of investment and the right types of services and the right frequencies to get at a clean condition across our city, many locations, if you will. So, so I, I think we would, uh, we understand your point and we generally agree with it and we want to roll it out in the course of these different service models. Kind of a 1.0 is our pilot, uh, trying to normalize it. And then a 2.0 is what we think is a more optimized way of getting the city clean. And the council will see that in the budget process in the spring. Okay. That, that, that's, I think, to your first question. To your second question on the enforcement side, um, I'm not specifically familiar with the level of fines, but what you've described, I'm sure is accurate. You and the mayor advanced that. It sounds pretty familiar to me. Um, I, I do just do know that on the enforcement side and I, I'm getting a little bit over my skis on the fireworks side, but I don't know that we can have every resident reporting you know, illegal dumping in terms of being able to um, convict somebody. I do think it is a, a city officer of some point, a police officer, a code enforcement officer, an environmental enforcement officer, what have you, that needs to witness it or get some type of evidence. It's certainly something we need to understand more and get a better handle on. And it's something that's on our roadmap, but it, it will take some real thought to figure out the right type of enforcement program. It, it could be one where we just shift people into that mode, where we just make that decision to do it, but there are other things that won't get done. If we just immediately made that decision, I don't know that we'd know immediately what else wouldn't get done. And I'm sure there would be repercussions for that. So I don't know that we're in the position right this minute to just redeploy uh, you know, a sizable team into illegal dumping enforcement. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe when we initiate some assessment of that early on, we may say, yep, it, 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 it's the best use and the way to do it, but I don't know that to be the case. And it certainly wasn't the case when I talked to the three departments about all the other priorities that they're working on in police, in code enforcement and in environmental enforcement. Are you saying that if, uh, if someone were caught in the act and, and, uh, uh, and they were to, you know, I've had residents who have said to me, I've come out at five in the morning as I'm getting ready to go to work. And I've had uh, people from outside of my community right in front of my house, empty out the back of their truck. Uh, I've, had that, that, I've had that story repeated to me, uh, uh, especially just recently. You know, I, I think people think that, you know, the state of COVID gives them license yeah. to come into this district and use it as their personal dumping ground, as if COVID shields us or blinds us from the most obvious, uh, you know, uh, violations. But anyway, the, the point is, so are you saying that if we were to catch someone in the act and videotape them and catch the license plate and are actually videotaping this person dumping it on the sidewalk that that would not be a case to find them maybe not the 10,000 because that's the repeated yeah. 
uh, dumping. But at the very least, at the very least, at the at the lowest end, which is I think twenty five hundred dollars, yeah. we could not find them. Let, let me let me say that. What what I would say is, if you have, if anybody in the community has video evidence of some of the illegal dumping, absolutely get that to us. Get it to the police department, and that is worth following up on. I think uh, undisputed video evidence probably gives us the best chance to prosecute short of one of our officers eyewitnessing it itself. So, so if, and I would encourage people, if you see it happening, yeah. video evidence and get that to the city. Well, and that's my point is that yeah. if we could figure out since we are not in a place where there's an infinite fountain of funds that we could employ a campaign. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, as I've, as I've driven through the city, uh, you know, Poor communities, challenged communities, communities uh, of uh, uh, of color, are are not particularly more dirty because of its residents. It's because we're used as as dumping grounds by outsiders, and uh, and for whatever reason, uh, individuals think that they can take their scraps from construction sites or when they empty out uh, their homes or they're moving, they come and they dump it here. And so this is what we've been dealing with continuously. And, and so the, the, the question that I have is, can we use our residents set of eyes and, uh, and use a carrot and a stick and say, look, if, if you want to uh, and can do it safely and we happen to collect the fine, we will share it with you. In addition to that, uh, I'm putting you on notice, Mr. Illegal Dumper, I'm going to put your face on a billboard. Can we do that legally and, and start using people as an example? San Jose will no longer be as your dumping ground. Councilman Carrasco, I, I think you're onto something. Could we talk about this offline? I think it's ultimately gonna require probably more city attorney resources, but I have an idea about how we can find those resources without affecting our budget. Um, I, I do think this is a really important idea. I, I, I just suspect it's not gonna come from police and code enforcement because they're stretched doing all the other things but i think there is a path here okay that that's great i'll take it offline i i, I uh okay that's that's fine i think um mayor because we co-authored that policy i just think that we need to start figuring out how to enforce it and use our citizens who are so frustrated and and frankly uh they want to change the narrative. They don't want to be seen as the district or the neighborhoods that uh, are are filled with filth because they're they're tired of being dumped on. So I want to be able to put that out there and be able to figure out how do we share the wealth with them if we in fact do figure out how to collect on uh, individuals who who continue to dump in our in our own backyards or in our own front yards, I should say. Uh, but I, you know, I'll go ahead and take that. I agree. I just got a text from one of your colleagues who wants to join in the conversation. So perhaps, Nora, if we could uh, have a conversation, we'll set something up among the four of us and, and anybody from the city manager's office who wants to join. And I think there's a way we can do this without uh, affecting, hopefully, staffing uh, resources. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then uh, and then I'll just I'll just say um, I'll just say one last thing about um, about the sanctioned encampments. You know, I, I have a, a little bit of a difference in opinion to my colleagues. You know, I actually, I actually, you know, I think we had had this conversation very early on again, also when I first came on board six years ago. You know, when when we have individuals who are living on the street and, and we, we haven't been able to house them, uh, when they're living in the creeks and the trails, you know, I, I don't need to say, repeat this. We, we all know this, we've been dealing with this. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, an issue that uh, not only does it impact our environment, but you know, it it's it's money that that um, that uh, that could be used for so many other issues. It, it costs our businesses. It costs our well. Anyway, I can go on and on and on, and uh, and and to be able to figure out how to uh, how to have services. And how to uh, how to have it centralized somewhere, at least temporarily. Even if we were able to pass or to figure out how to sunset 
a, a local po uh, city policy uh, until we get through COVID, um, you know, it doesn't have to be an, uh, an indefinite uh, policy, but sunset maybe over the next 18 months until we had enough uh, production, enough housing units to house our, our folks permanently. I think that I think we need to consider it. The other is, uh, you know, who was it? Jackie mentioned that it took nine weeks. Was it Jackie? Uh, that took nine weeks to speak to our folks out by the Monterey corridor. Uh, we need to have greater communication and coordination with the county. Th these are county services and they need to be out there in full force. Um, I have to say that when I was uh, in, in, uh, engaged in the county campaign um, to replace uh, uh, now Senator-elect Dave Cortezzi, I, I, I found that there was only one full-time social worker assigned to our homeless encampments. I mean, she, she or he has a team of individuals that go out and visit the encampments, but there's only one full-time uh, social worker, at, which... Uh, blows my mind when you think of the magnitude of, uh, of this job. And this is the individual that's in charge of all of the encampments throughout the entire county. And so uh, as you can imagine, that's, that's not nearly uh, enough to, to truly deal with the issues that we're dealing with. And I think that's the reason why we're having to expend so much time and energy and resources to coax and to support uh, the individuals that are living out in the streets and in the creeks and in the, in the um, you know, in the trails uh, in the city of San Jose. So uh, anything that we can do to encourage uh, a relationship with the county that can truly invest uh, greater resources, um, you know, I, I'm on board and, and, uh, and I'm open to having those conversations with all of you to see how we can support. And that, that's it for me, uh, Mayor. I Thank don't know you. If you have anything that you want to add regarding that, but, uh, but I think that that's, a, that's, I think that's a huge issue. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I agree. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, this is also a really good segue um, into some of what I was uh, going to talk about. And I'm glad that uh, Councilmember Carrasco is talking about really um, behavior modification is what we ultimately want. And I know that the Department of Transportation knows how uh, the state of Texas really changed um, their illegal dumping on their uh, highways with their, um, really the symptom of a lot of uh, systems uh, not working together and failing some of our residents. Um, and now we have them on our streets. Um, and so I guess it, it really depends on, on the, oh, excuse me, on the, um, on the lenses that you're looking at. But I think there's something that really, really unifies all of us. And that is that we all wanna um, do our part in contributing uh, to the city of San Jose and beautifying. And I, I, I love the, the beautify San Jose um, title of program, um, because it, it basically uh, shows the vision of what we want San Jose to be. Um, and so I think that piece is a little unfinished. Um, I know that there's not really part of this presentation, but I wonder if this is something, um, I know we've been asking you, first of all, we've been asking you to do a lot. And I appreciate all of uh, the, the deep level of, of analysis here. I mean, doing this dashboard where you were, uh, we're taking a look at, re uh, we're, we're basically have an inventory of terms of, of sites and the level of severity at each site is a huge, just huge um, um, uh, work, workload for multiple um, departments to do um, when we are in the middle of a pandemic. And when our eyes really should be on um, the the healthy well-being of our community, um, but yet you know this is an issue that that I think many um, of my colleagues find just as important. I uh, will not um, 
shy away from saying that this is not as important to me as making sure that children don't fail, that, um, that we are uh, connected to the internet, that people have access to a health provider um, and that they're re-employed. And so, um, but, but because this is the focus of today's study session, I will also focus on this issue. And so I'm, I'll ask a question about, is there something that is in the works in terms of behavior modification? I know that, that uh, the mayor and, and council member Carrasco will take this particular um, discussion off the floor, but I'm wondering about the staff. Yeah, council member, the roadmap that we showed, the 2021 roadmap and the concept organization that Neil showed uh, has specific references to kind of a communication, education and enforcement branch uh, or program or, or initiative, if you will. And I think we recognize the importance of that. It, it starts with communication and, and educating uh, that attempts to lead to behavior modification. We start with education, make sure people are aware and they, they know what the right thing to do is. And then from there you move into having consequences and enforcing if people don't kind of get, get the message, you know, don't mess with us, et cetera. Um, it's on our roadmap. It certainly is going to be a significant resource investment to kind of take maybe what we've done in the past to limited levels to figure out what is kind of a full scope of a program that's really going to have impact and going to change behavior and going to have consequences and, and make it completely unacceptable to do dumping in our city. It's a big undertaking. It's a big undertaking because the departments that normally do the enforcement are engaged in many other things. There are many other things to enforce in our city. Um, you're, you're very aware of, of all of those other priorities that we're dealing with. It is on our roadmap. We do have to find resources to be able to kind of put a good program campaign and the enforcement net mechanisms in place. And so that's something we would like to scope and then present to the council in the budget process for 21-22. That, that's kind of how I see us having the best chance to, to understand a program and then what will it take to put it in place to ultimately get results. Right, and you know, this leads me to uh, what we already have in place, which is a beautiful San Jose. And I think this is um, one of the best uses um, in terms of, of community, um, uh, that we've employed so far, because it's given us a tremendous amount of volunteer hours. Um, uh, it, it's given us a community that knows its own community and knows where to look and, and has um, the ear of their neighbors. Um, and so they know where to clean up. And, and I was a bit disappointed to see that um, Beautify San Jose grants are on that, on that column of suspended services at this point. Do you find that at this point, um, they're not providing as much? Um, I know that, that I think that was suspended because most of the folks couldn't um, spend their grants and you know that timeline was extended until the end of the year. But there's, there's groups that are really active that continue to do um, a lot of online and that I've actually been part of myself. And I think it, it continues to build um, rapport and community among, among um, uh, those members so that, that when the time comes, they can actually go outside once again, continue to do their little or pick up or at some point, maybe do some limited uh, you know, um, distance uh, appropriate distance uh, litter pickup. I just think that that if we drop it off now, we're going to have to rebuild once again, and we're really losing some resources there. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about that decision? Yeah, I'll, I'll have Olympia briefly get into that, Council Member. I think um, that they are starting to get back and to fulfill the grants that were previously awarded to them. Um, and I know we've started back most all of our other Beautify SJ services, but, but Neil and Olympia, any quick feedback to the council member on the, the current grantees and then 
have we restarted others or is that something that would be kind of one of the final things to restart? I would say on, on one end, uh, council member, the, um, the effort in terms of extending the uh, ability for the uh, uh, neighborhood groups to uh, do their services beyond what we originally had issued in their contract, right, is a good thing, right? The shelter in place effort, um, we didn't want to create, you know, an additional administrative burden that their grants would um, end right in the middle of this pandemic. So just on the one end, the we allowed their uh, contracts to be extended for, you know, for three years. The, um, I think the effort of where we want to go in the in the future with uh, the Beautify San Jose grants is, is definitely uh, what we want to institute, you know, going to the next, into the next uh, fiscal year. I think one of our challenges just across the entire system is um, the capacity of our staff that are, are managing that grant system, right? Uh, here in Park and Rec, it's uh, the grant teams is spread across both food, branch, department work, plus, you know, all the other things that they're working on. Um, and so one, our base philosophy was to try to minimize the administrative burden from the neighborhood groups. But, uh, you know, we want to ensure that they have that ability to do their services. Um, we want to make sure that they are doing it in a safe, you know, and socially distanced manner. Um, you know, as you know, the uh, California and the Bay Area were rapidly changing our statistics. So, you know, uh, we do want those residents to get out there and, and support our work. Um, we want to make sure that it's being done safely and that we have, um, you know, the ability to, to get them their grants and to get them their, uh, uh, their, their, their money to do their work. Um, Olympia, do you have anything else you want to input? No. Okay. Okay, so at this point, it sounds like the administrative effort is is beyond the capacity of the staff as you're redeployed to do other things. Um, at this point, the best thing is to do is to put a pause on Beautify San Jose. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, the the contracts that they have now they're extended. They can continue to do the work. Um, it, getting the new here right now. Yeah, so we'll be watching that throughout the next six months to get into where we will be for the next. Uh, next fiscal year's um, effort. So if they haven't spent the money at the end of this year, which you know, is less than a month, would, would there be a consideration to continue uh, to have another extension? I, I would say most likely, yes. I mean, we are, our goal is to be um, uh, very friendly uh, to the services and the neighborhood groups that are out there. Uh, we don't want to continue to add barriers to this. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah I, I really appreciate that. I think there's a lot that um, a lot of folks who who've come together because of, of litter and trash and then in, in that process have found companionship and, um, you know, and joined forces in, in other areas uh, for advocacy, um, not, not just exclusive to trash and litter or the unhoused community, but primarily there's folks who um, who have a neighborhood association like the ones uh, along Thompson Creek, and they are there because of the unhoused community. They keep these issues really close to heart. They, they you know, as you all know, one of the um, porta parties was stolen um, from Thompson Creek. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happens uh, discreetly. Um, <laughs> But but it happens nonetheless, and and uh, and I know it was something that we actually that group advocated. I advocated um, for it on their behalf as well, so that we could have that out there. Thank you for replacing it. Um, when these things happen, I, uh, there was one question that was kind of left on, um, I guess, on, unanswered. There was the cleanup from a porta potty um, being stolen. And I know this is very specific, but and if we want, if you if you want, we can take this offline so we can find out a little bit more about that protocol. But in, in case this continues to happen around um, around Thompson Creek, we know that the the unhoused community there is is has been there for a really long time. I don't anticipate. Um, those folks going anywhere. That's basically their home. They've participated in keeping um, the creek uh, clean. And from what I understand from the San Jose, from the water company, uh, Valley Water now, um, is that they're one of the most cleanest creeks in the city because of this. And so I think it speaks to 
um, this this joint effort from the community with with trash pickup and with the unhoused community, and I think it's something that really works. I just don't want to lose it. I I know that you you know this true, and I see you you all nodding, and so I I just want to um, make sure I advocate for that. I know that we had a couple of our community leaders on the phone um, from some of these neighborhood associations, and they sent us some messages saying. One of them was, you know, they they have their kids at home, so obviously, you know, they, have, they school them, and uh, some stuff was happening at home, so they couldn't stay on. But they want to let you know, and this is from the Evergreen Leadership um, Neighborhood Association, is that they want you to know that they continue to be a resource to you and want to remain that way. Uh, and you know, not too long ago, maybe about uh, maybe about a month ago, uh, they invited me, and we did this with, you know, of course, properly distanced. Um, in a properly distance way, they beautified an electrical box on the corner of, of uh, Tully and um, White. And so, you know, they continue to do the work um, out there. Obviously, it's, it's very much uh, reduced um, because usually they're out there picking up litter on an ongoing basis. Um, but, you know, everybody has to, to kind of revise what they're doing. So anyways, that is my pitch for Beautify San Jose grants so that we can continue to do those things so that our neighborhoods don't feel abandoned. And, you know, it gives them the resources to continue to pick up the trash, to, per, you know, to do all the things that they do to, to keep each other uh, motivated and, and supported. And so that's all I'll, I'll say about that, but that was important to me um, to put out there. Um, the other thing that I was gonna say, I really appreciate that you had this, um, uh, the new kind of uh, uh, information uh, that details how um, how uh, home uh, the unhoused community is notified in terms of of um, cleanup, and I wonder if uh, if you can make it a little more visual in case there's some folks who can't read or for whatever reasons are not able to read that they could actually see you know from like one, two, three, and a little visual um, that could facilitate that. I mean, I think it looks, it looks really, really great. Um, you're always gonna have folks like myself who are gonna say, but one more thing, right? And so I apologize about that. I know that you've done a really great job already. Um, and I know that we're, we're really um, pushing you um, in terms of, of capacity here. Um, this is just one thing that I, I wanted to make sure that in case there's some folks who can't read and, and because of that, you, they might not comply. Um, and, uh, and then the last thing I just wanted to say was thank you um, because I know that you heard me about my Welch Community Center. There's not very many times where I pipe up and talk about uh, the trash and litter because like I said at the beginning of my comments, that is not the priority for me. Um, and even though I get a lot of folks calling in um, from our residents asking me to do something about this, my priority right now is supporting my community so that they can continue to be healthy, um, to continue to be connected to a, serve, uh, to a medical provider, that their children are healthy, um, and that they're supported um, with some uh, with, digi with our digital inclusion efforts as well as childcare. Um, and so, um, uh, but but I do want to say thank you uh, for helping us with that. This this I don't ask um, for any clearance of our unhoused community lightly. Um, I've never I haven't done that with you. I haven't asked you to do that before, and I only asked you and I advocated for this because these are areas that we're actually u utilizing for our families on an everyday basis. And so I think you know that it, it kind of impedes the right of way for those families and and the sense of security. Uh, for those families who are, are um, provide, you know, who we're providing the service for, and they're trusting us with their children on an everyday basis. And so, I really want to thank you for your support at, at the Welch Park Community. Um, uh, I won't say center because it's really a room. <laughs> so the uh, the Welch Community Room, um, but nonetheless, I I, I really appreciate that, um, Jim. I know that you, you went out of your way to to make sure that you heard. Um, what I was saying in terms of, of strategy and prioritizing uh, locations 
that, that have um, our children and our families um, still uh, attending and uh, having them utilize our, our actual city buildings and facilities. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate um, you honoring that, that request. And not only just for me, because I never only uh, advocate just for my own district, but that really is, um, um, and really I only have I think that loca two locations in my district, but for the rest of our city, because this is really impacts our families and our children. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing, Sarah, Rick, Olympia, Neil, um, of course, Jim, but I know that there's um, a whole page full of people and I did see that and I did see some, some, some of the names who've, uh, who've helped out and they're just not names, but they're folks who are dedicated. Mm -hmm. There's not time for me to read them all, but but I just want to say thank you to them as well. So um, those are those are my comments. Thank you. And thank you, Councilor Diab. Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, I know we're past time, so I'm going to be really quick here. Uh, there was talk earlier about uh, you know don't mess with Texas. I think that's a great idea. I'm I'm, I'm from Texas, and I grew up watching those ads. But I I, I just want to say that that there's something unique not just with the ads but with the state of texas and there's a sense of pride there that is part country music and part just kind of this this myth making about you know texas texas exceptional exceptionalism um and you know having superstars like willie nelson go on tv and, and sing things like you know mamas don't let don't let your babies mess with texas so i i think that's a hard thing to to replicate you know just in san jose if not california um, but i support that kind of uh, civic pride building to whatever extent we can do it. Um, but it's not just paintings of a, a trash can, don't mess with San Jose. It's, it's really more about building this, this sense of San Jose. Um, and that speaks not just to beautifying San Jose, uh, but more to the, the work that we've already done with hashtag, you know, we are San Jose and, and all that, but bringing uh, the community together in this united um, you know, again, sense of civic pride. We're not just the Vietnamese community or the Hispanic community or or whatever it may be. We we are San Jose, and and building on that, I think uh, there's some way to go. But my real questions, though, were um, having to do with. I remember about, I forget how long now. I want to say over a year now, uh, at a VTA board meeting, as a, a VTA study session, um, uh, Mr. I think Tony Tavares, the 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 District Four Caltrans representative, uh, he mentioned that he was working on. Uh, funding people to pick up trash in Santa Clara County on Caltrans land. And it was just a few people, but they would be a dedicated group of folks. And then I, I try to follow up on that thread, but I, I don't know that it ever happened. Does anybody know if Caltrans has a, a dedicated group of like two, three, five people going around and, and picking up sites off of freeways? Well, we're working very closely with um, Director Tavares and his team, council member. Um, they have their Caltrans teams. They also have, there's a countywide agreement that they direct and guide using the California Conservation Corps to do work in Santa Clara County on Caltrans property. So they certainly have dedicated resources or these are duties of people that work in our city in the county. Um, I think what we're going through and figuring out is how much resource do they need? How proactive would, do they need to do that work to get consistently clean conditions? And that's what we're working on them. We have regular workshops now. Uh, Sarah and her data team and Olympia and her team are working with the Caltrans data and mapping people to, to identify all the locations, whose jurisdiction, who covers it, what's it gonna take to get them clean? So tremendous amount of work going on in that area. Okay, so and Jim, could, could I also supplement that answer just a little bit? Because uh, sure. this, I know, has been a long standing issue for us. Uh, uh, Tony has since left. He's now uh, down in LA. But Tony's predecessor uh, was someone we had brought, <laughs> maybe you remember, Bijan, uh, this issue to way back in 2015, just saying, you guys aren't doing enough in San Clair County. They kept insisting they were. We, we pushed them to show, them, show us their books. Uh, and this is Tony's predecessor again. And we, we ultimately identified that there was a significant gap between what they were spending here per capita and what they were spending elsewhere in Alameda County and other counties. Uh, and it also became apparent through those conversations that although they hired people to work here uh, or they tried to, uh, they couldn't keep people here because of the very high cost of living and because Caltrans was paying exactly the same amount, whether you worked in Fresno or San Jose. 
And so what really became apparent is they weren't able to even keep people working here and they weren't devoting the resources anyway. And so uh, many of us pushed, including Senator Bell and myself and others, uh, and we pushed for them to sign deals with the Conservation Corps through the county and ultimately as well um, with, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think there was another organization and then obviously to, to do a better job of getting folks here and we were trying to literally help them hire people for the Caltrans staff uh, and get them through the medical clearance and everything else. Uh, the bottom line is it continues to be a problem because uh, as soon as they hire folks, uh, those people uh, understandably decide to relocate somewhere else where it's more affordable. And so we have an ongoing challenge with staffing uh, and I think it's just a, a monthly battle we have to fight. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Jim. I guess that answers my question. I guess it didn't follow through with what I was hoping would, would happen, um, but it seems they have resources. So let's let's keep working with them and, and pushing. My second and final question is, it has to do with the MasterCard uh, for the Cash for Trash program. Um, dur during the pandemic, uh, you know, we've eaten out or I've eaten out less and, and you know, I'm doing more grocery shopping and there are these credit cards uh, that are giving bonus points for grocery shopping. And so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to maximize that. And what I do is I, I buy my whatever you know, chips and, and soda, and then I'll maybe buy a $50 gift card um, just to get the extra points and, and maximize the offering. But my, the point is I, I now have a bunch of $50 gift cards and, and um, trying to spend them is not as easy as you would think. It, it's, it's good as cash, uh, but, you know, you go and you buy a Slurpee or, or whatever and you draw down the card and eventually there's a balance of like, you know, $5 and six cents on the card and you're trying to buy dinner that's, or a, a Subway sandwich or something that's like 15. And, and uh, you know, or even if there's just like five cents left on the card, like how do you, where do you go to charge five cents off the card? So I guess what I'm asking is, uh, are the, the cards reloadable? And, and if we're just handing them out with a max of $20 upper limit, uh, are, we, are we contemplating how difficult it is to actually spend dollars, like, you know, to buy things in, in increments of $20 at a time. You go to a store, you, you say, here, I'm buying $50 worth of stuff, but can you give me two transactions of, of you know, or three transactions of $20? Does that make sense? Oh, yes. So these are reloadable MasterCards. So if we load $20 on the card and a person spends 10, and the next time they participate in the program, we load another $20 on, their money continues to remain on the card. So it's not treated like a gift card where a person has to go in and say, I have exactly ten dollars and eight cents on the card to try to use. Okay, so can can they if they had an, an, another source of money, could they load money onto that card and have a balance of say fifty dollars, even though we're only putting on twenty? Yes, they they can reload additional money if they want mm -hmm. to on the card. Okay, and and it was I think the mayor mentioned earlier that it's a way of helping them have access to banking. Could we or could I hear more about that? Yes, I can definitely send you more detailed information, but those that participate, this is a MasterCard City Possible program, so that card can be used for a multitude of things, including banking, other social services programs. If a person has a job, they can also have their paycheck loaded onto their card as well, so a person could have access to a debit card and purchase items to kind of start a banking history. I'll definitely send, your, um, I'll send you some additional information about the City Possible card and program and how that works. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I'll, I'll end there and let everybody have their day back. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from any colleagues? I know, I think we've exhausted staff on this. I want to really thank everybody for hanging around an extra 40 minutes. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of talk about, uh, you know, don't mess with Texas and other kinds of slogans. I, I could tell you, uh, we have been exploring this. I think when we launched Beautify San Jose uh, or Beautify SJ, it was Kitty Sesweta who had 15 or 20 years experience in marketing and worked with us. And I think, I can't remember, I think it was Paul Pereira and, and Katie that came up with Beautify SJ and we thought it was great, but we are always open to new slogans and new monikers we can use to get people motivated uh, because we know this is going to take a village uh, because let's face it, we've got uh, a very uh, heavily populated village to clean here in city of San Jose. So anyway, Really appreciate all the great work being done by everybody on the city team. Uh, we know there's a lot more to do, but I think we're off to a great start. Thanks everyone. Thank you.